Chapter Twenty One of the Oregon Trail. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Oregon Trail by Francis Parkman Jr. Chapter Twenty One: The Pueblo and Bent's Fort. We approached the gate of the pueblo. It was a wretched species of fort of most primitive construction, being nothing more than a large square enclosure surrounded by a wall of mud, miserably cracked and dilapidated. The slender pickets that surmounted it were half broken down, and the gate dangled on its wooden hinges so loosely that to open or shut it seemed likely to fling it down altogether. Two or three squalid Mexicans with their broad hats and their vile faces overgrown with hair were lounging about the bank of the river in front of it. They disappeared as they saw us approach, and as we rode up to the gate a light active little figure came out to meet us. It was our old friend Richard. He had come from Fort Laramie on a trading expedition to Taos, but finding when he reached the Pueblo that the war would prevent him going farther, he was quietly waiting till the conquest of the country should allow him to proceed. He seemed to consider himself bound to do the honors of the place. Shaking us warmly by the hands, he led the way into the area. Here we saw his large Santa Fe wagons standing together. A few squaws and Spanish women, and a few Mexicans, as mean and miserable as the place itself, were lazily sauntering about. Richard conducted us to the state apartment of the Pueblo, a small mud room, very neatly finished, considering the material, and garnished with a crucifix, a looking-glass, a picture of the Virgin, and a rusty horse-pistol. There were no chairs, but instead of them a number of chests and boxes ranged about the room. There was another room beyond, less sumptuously decorated, and here three or four Spanish girls, one of them very pretty, were baking cakes at a mud fireplace in the corner. They brought out a poncho which they spread upon the floor by way of tablecloth. A supper which seemed to us luxurious was soon laid out upon it, and folded buffalo robes were placed around it to receive the guests. Two or three Americans besides ourselves were present. We sat down Turkish fashion and began to inquire the news. Richard told us that, about three weeks before, General Kearney's army had left Bent's Fort to march against Santa Fe, that when last heard from they were approaching the mountainous defiles that led to the city. One of the Americans produced a dingy newspaper containing an account of the battles of Palo Alto and Resaca de la Palma. While we were discussing these matters, the doorway was darkened by a tall, shambling fellow who stood with his hands in his pockets, taking a leisurely survey of the premises before he entered. He wore brown homespun pantaloons, much too short for his legs, and a pistol and bowie knife stuck in his belt. His head and one eye were enveloped in a huge bandage of white linen. Having completed his observations, he came slouching in and sat down on a chest. Eight or ten more of the same stamp followed, and very coolly arranging themselves about the room, began to stare at the company. Shaw and I looked at each other. We were forcibly reminded of the Oregon emigrants, though these unwelcome visitors had a certain glitter of the eye and a compression of the lips which distinguished them from our old acquaintances of the prairie. They began to catechize us at once, inquiring whence we had come, and what we meant to do next, and what were our future prospects in life. The man with the bandaged head had met with an untoward accident a few days before. He was going down to the river to bring water, and was pushing through the young willows which covered the low ground, when he came unawares upon a grizzly bear, which, having just eaten a buffalo bull, had lain down to sleep off the meal. The bear rose on his hind legs and gave the intruder such a blow with his paw that he laid his forehead entirely bare, clawed off the front of his scalp, and narrowly missed one of his eyes. Fortunately, he was not in a very pugnacious mood, being surfeited with his late meal. The man's companions, who were close behind, raised a shout, and the bear walked away, crushing down the willows in his leisurely retreat. These men belonged to a party of Mormons, who, out of a well-grounded fear of the other emigrants, had postponed leaving the settlements until all the rest were gone. On account of this delay, they did not reach Fort Laramie until it was too late to continue their journey to California. 
hearing that there was good land at the head of the Arkansas, they crossed over under the guidance of Richard, and were now preparing to spend the winter at a spot about half a mile from the Pueblo. When we took leave of Richard, it was near sunset. Passing out of the gate, we could look down the little valley of the Arkansas. A beautiful scene, and doubly so to our eyes, so long accustomed to deserts and mountains. Tall woods lined the river, with green meadows on either hand, and high bluffs quietly basking in the sunlight flanked the narrow valley. A Mexican on horseback was driving a herd of cattle toward the gate, and our little white tent, which the men had pitched under a large tree in the meadow, made a very pleasing feature in the scene. When we reached it, we found that Richard had sent a Mexican to bring us an abundant supply of green corn and vegetables, and invite us to help ourselves to whatever we wished from the fields around the Pueblo. The inhabitants were in daily apprehensions of an inroad from more formidable consumers than ourselves. Every year at the time when the corn begins to ripen, the Arapahoes, to the number of several thousands, come and encamp around the Pueblo. The handful of white men who are entirely at the mercy of this swarm of barbarians choose to make a merit of necessity. They come forward very cordially, shake them by the hand, and intimate that the harvest is entirely at their disposal. The Arapahoes take them at their word, help themselves most liberally, and usually turn their horses into the cornfields afterward. They have the foresight, however, to leave enough of the crops untouched to serve as an inducement for planting the fields again for their benefit in the next spring. The human race in this part of the world is separated into three divisions arranged in the order of their merits, white men, Indians, and Mexicans, to the latter of whom the honorable title of whites is by no means conceded. In spite of the warm sunset of that evening, the next morning was a dreary and cheerless one. It rained steadily, clouds resting upon the very treetops. We crossed the river to visit the Mormon settlement. As we passed through the water, several trappers on horseback entered it from the other side. Their buckskin frocks were soaked through by the rain and clung fast to their limbs with a most clammy and uncomfortable look. The water was trickling down their faces and dropping from the ends of their rifles and from the traps which each carried at the pommel of his saddle. Horses and all, they had a most disconsolate and woebegone appearance, which we could not help laughing at, forgetting how often we ourselves had been in a similar plight. After half an hour's riding, we saw the white wagons of the Mormons drawn up among the trees. Axes were sounding, trees were falling, and log huts going up along the edge of the woods and upon the adjoining meadow. As we came up, the Mormons left their work and seated themselves on the timber around us when they began earnestly to discuss points of theology, complain of the ill usage they had received from the Gentiles, and sound a lamentation over the loss of their great temple at Nauvoo. After remaining with them an hour, we rode back to our camp, happy that the settlements had been delivered from the presence of such blind and desperate fanatics. On the morning after this, we left the Pueblo for Bent's Fort. The conduct of Raymond had lately been less satisfactory than before, and we had discharged him as soon as we arrived at the former place, so that the party, ourselves included, was now reduced to four. There was some uncertainty as to our future course. The trail between Bent's Fort and the settlements, a distance computed at six hundred miles, was at this time in a dangerous state, for since the passage of General Kearney's army, great numbers of hostile Indians, chiefly Pawnees and Comanches, had gathered about some parts of it. A little after this time they became so numerous and audacious that scarcely a single party, however large, passed between the fort and the frontier without some token of their hostility. The newspapers of the time sufficiently display this state of things. Many men were killed, and great numbers of horses and mules carried off. Not long since I met with a gentleman, who during the autumn came from Santa Fe to Bent's Fort, when he found a party of seventy men who thought themselves too weak to go down to the settlements alone, and were waiting there for a reinforcement. Though this excessive timidity fully proves the ignorance and credulity of the men, it may also evince the state of alarm which prevailed in the country. When we were there in the month of August, the danger had not become so great. There was nothing very attractive in the neighborhood. 
we supposed moreover that we might wait there half the winter without finding any party to go down with us for mr sublet and the others whom we had relied upon had as richard told us already left bett's fort thus far on our journey fortune had kindly befriended us we resolved therefore to take advantage of her gracious mood and trusting for a continuance of her favors to set out with henry and delorier and run the gauntlet of the indians in the best way we could bent's fort stands on the river about seventy-five miles below the pueblo at noon of the third day we arrived within three or four miles of it pitched our tent under a tree hung our looking-glasses against its trunk and having made our primitive toilet rode toward the fort we soon came in sight of it for it is visible from a considerable distance standing with its high clay walls in the midst of the scorching plains it seemed as if a swarm of locusts had invaded the country the grass for miles around was cropped close by the horses of general kearney's soldiery when we came to the fort we found that not only had the horses eaten up the grass but their owners had made away with the stores of the little trading post so that we had great difficulty in procuring the few articles which we required for our homeward journey the army was gone the life and bustle passed away and the fort was a scene of dull and lazy tranquillity a few invalid officers and soldiers sauntered about the area which was oppressively hot for the glaring sun was reflected down upon it from the high white walls around the proprietors were absent and we were received by mr holt who had been left in charge of the fort he invited us to dinner where to our admiration we found a table laid with a white cloth with casters in the centre and chairs placed around it this unwonted repast concluded we rode back to our camp here as we lay smoking round the fire after supper we saw through the dusk three men approaching from the direction of the fort they rode up and seated themselves near us on the ground the foremost was a tall well-formed man with a face and manner such as inspire confidence at once he wore a broad hat of felt slouching and tattered and the rest of his attire consisted of a frock and leggings of buckskin rubbed with the yellow clay found among the mountains at the heel of one of his moccasins was buckled a huge iron spur with a rowel five or six inches in diameter his horse who stood quietly looking over his head had a rude mexican saddle covered with a shaggy bearskin and furnished with a pair of wooden stirrups of most preposterous size the next man was a sprightly active little fellow about five feet and a quarter high but very strong and compact his face was swarthy as a mexican's and covered with a close curly black beard an old greasy calico handkerchief was tied round his head and his close buckskin dress was blackened and polished by grease and hard service the last who came up was a large strong man dressed in the coarse homespun of the frontiers who dragged his long limbs over the ground as if he were too lazy for the effort he had a sleepy gray eye a retreating chin an open mouth and a protruding upper lip which gave him an air of exquisite indolence and helplessness he was armed with an old united states jaeger which redoubtable weapon though he could never hit his mark with it he was accustomed to cherish as the very sovereign of firearms the first two men belonged to a party who had just come from california with a large band of horses which they had disposed of at bent's fort monroe the taller of the two was from iowa he was an excellent fellow open warm-hearted and intelligent jim gurney the short man was a boston sailor who had come in a trading vessel to california and taken the fancy to return across the continent the journey had already made him an expert mountain man and he presented the extraordinary phenomenon of a sailor who understood how to manage a horse the third of our visitors named ellis was a missourian who had come out with a party of oregon emigrants but having got as far as bridges fort he had fallen homesick or as jim averred lovesick and ellis was just the man to be balked in a love adventure he thought proper to join the california men and return homeward in their company they now requested that they might unite with our party and make the journey to the settlements in company with us we readily assented for we liked the appearance of the first two men and were very glad to gain so efficient a reinforcement we told them to meet us on the next evening at a spot on the riverside about six miles below the fort 
having smoked a pipe together, our new allies left us, and we lay down to sleep. End of chapter 21「Twenty Two of the Oregon Trail. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Oregon Trail by Francis Parkman, Jr. Chapter Twenty Two, Tete Rouge the Volunteer. The next morning, having directed Delorier to repair with his car to the place of meeting, we came again to the fort to make some arrangements for the journey. After completing these, we sat down under a sort of perch to smoke with some Cheyenne Indians whom we found there. In a few minutes we saw an extraordinary little figure approach us in a military dress. He had a small round countenance garnished about the eyes with the kind of wrinkles commonly known as crow's feet, and surrounded by an abundant crop of red curls with a little cap resting on the top of them. Altogether he had the look of a man more conversant with mint juleps and oyster suppers than with the hardships of prairie service. He came up to us and entreated that we would take him home to the settlements, saying that unless he went with us he should have to stay all winter at the fort. We liked our petitioner's appearance so little that we excused ourselves from complying with his request. At this he begged us so hard to take pity on him, looked so disconsolate, and told so lamentable a story that at last we consented, though not without many misgivings. The rugged Anglo-Saxon of our new recruit's real name proved utterly unmanageable on the lips of our French attendants, and Henry Chatillon, after various abortive attempts to pronounce it, one day coolly christened him Tête Rouge in honor of his red curls. He had at different times been clerk of a Mississippi steamboat, an agent in a trading establishment at Nauvoo, besides filling various other capacities, in all of which he had seen much more of life than was good for him. In the spring, thinking that a summer's campaign would be an agreeable recreation, he had joined a company of St. Louis volunteers. "'There were three of us,' said Tête Rouge, "'me and Bill Stevens and John Hopkins.' We thought we would just go out with the army, and when we had conquered the country we would get discharged and take our pay, you know, and go down to Mexico. They say there is plenty of fun going on there. Then we could go back to New Orleans by way of Veracruz. But Tete Rouge, like many a stouter volunteer, had reckoned without his host. Fighting Mexicans was a less amusing occupation than he had supposed, and his pleasure trip was disagreeably interrupted by brain fever, which attacked him when about halfway to Bent's Fort. He jolted along through the rest of the journey in a baggage wagon. When they came to the fort, he was taken out and left there, together with the rest of the sick. Bent's fort does not supply the best accommodations for an invalid. Tete Rouge's sick chamber was a little mud room, where he and a companion attacked by the same disease were laid together, with nothing but a buffalo robe between them and the ground. The assistant surgeon's deputy visited them once a day and brought them each a huge dose of calomel the only medicine, according to his surviving victim, which he was acquainted with. Tete Rouge woke one morning, and turning to his companion, saw his eyes fixed upon the beams above with the glassy stare of a dead man. At this the unfortunate volunteer lost his senses outright. In spite of the doctor, however, he eventually recovered, though between the brain fever and the calomel, his mind, originally none of the strongest, was so much shaken that it had not quite recovered its balance when we came to the fort. In spite of the poor fellow's tragic story, there was something so ludicrous in his appearance, and the whimsical contrast between his military dress and his most unmilitary demeanor, that we could not help smiling at them. We asked him if he had a gun. He said they had taken it from him during his illness, and he had not seen it since. But perhaps, he observed, looking at me with a beseeching air, you will lend me one of your big pistols if we should meet with any Indians. I next inquired if he had a horse. He declared he had a magnificent one, and at Shaw's request a Mexican led him in for inspection. He exhibited the outline of a good horse, but his eyes were sunk in the sockets, and every one of his ribs could be counted. There were certain marks, too, about his shoulders, which could be accounted for by the circumstance that during Tete Rouge's illness his companions had seized upon the insulted charger and harnessed him to a cannon along with the draft horses. 
To Tete Rouge's astonishment, we recommended him by all means to exchange the horse if he could for a mule. Fortunately, the people at the fort were so anxious to get rid of him that they were willing to make some sacrifice to effect the object, and he succeeded in getting a tolerable mule in exchange for the broken-down steed. A man soon appeared at the gate, leading in the mule by a cord which he placed in the hands of Tete Rouge, who, being somewhat afraid of his new acquisition, tried various flatteries and blandishments to induce her to come forward. The mule, knowing that she was expected to advance, stopped short in consequence, and stood fast as a rock, looking straight forward with immovable composure. Being stimulated by a blow from behind, she consented to move, and walked nearly to the other side of the fort before she stopped again. Hearing the bystanders laugh, Tete Rouge plucked up spirit and tugged hard at the rope. The mule jerked backward, spun herself round, and made a dash for the gate. Tete Rouge, who clung manfully to the rope, went whisking through the air for a few rods, when he let go and stood with his mouth open, staring after the mule, who galloped away over the prairie. She was soon caught and brought back by a Mexican, who mounted a horse and went in pursuit of her with his lasso. Having thus displayed his capacity for prairie travel, Tete Rouge proceeded to supply himself with provisions for the journey, and with this view he applied to a quartermaster's assistant who was in the fort. This official had a face as sour as vinegar, being in a state of chronic indignation because he had been left behind the army. He was as anxious as the rest to get rid of Tete Rouge. So, producing a rusty key, he opened a low door which led to a half-subterranean apartment into which the two disappeared together. After some time they came out again, Tete Rouge greatly embarrassed by a multiplicity of paper parcels containing the different articles of his forty days' rations. They were consigned to the care of Delorier, who about that time passed by with a cart on his way to the appointed place of meeting with Monroe and his companions. We next urged Tete Rouge to provide himself, if he could, with a gun. He accordingly made earnest appeals to the charity of various persons in the fort, but totally without success, a circumstance which did not greatly disturb us, since in the event of a skirmish he would be much more apt to do mischief to himself or his friends than to the enemy. When all these arrangements were completed, we saddled our horses and were preparing to leave the fort, when, looking round, we discovered that our new associate was in fresh trouble. A man was holding the mule for him in the middle of the fort, while he tried to put the saddle on her back, but she kept stepping sideways and moving round and round in a circle until he was almost in despair. It required some assistance before all his difficulties could be overcome. At length he clambered into the black war saddle on which he was to have carried terror into the ranks of the Mexicans. "'Get up,' said Tete Rouge. "'Come along now. Go along, will you?' The mule walked deliberately forward out of the gate. Her recent conduct had inspired him with so much awe that he never dared to touch her with his whip. We trotted forward toward the place of meeting, but before he had gone far, we saw that Tete Rouge's mule, who perfectly understood her rider, had stopped and was quietly grazing, in spite of his protestations, at some distance behind. So, getting behind him, we drove him and the contumacious mule before us until we could see through the twilight the gleaming of a distant fire. Monroe, Jim, and Ellis were lying around it. Their saddles, packs, and weapons were scattered about, and their horses picketed near them. Delorier was there, too, with our little cart. Another fire was soon blazing high. We invited our new allies to take a cup of coffee with us. When both the others had gone over to their side of the camp, Jim Gurney still stood by the blaze, puffing hard at his little black pipe, as short and weather-beaten as himself. Well, he said, here are eight of us. We'll call it six, for them two boobies, Ellis over yonder and that new man of yours, won't count for anything. We'll get through well enough, never fear for that, unless the Comanches happen to get foul of us. End of chapter 22「Chapter twenty three of the Oregon Trail. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Oregon Trail by Francis Parkman, Jr. Chapter twenty three Indian Alarms. <laughs> 
We began our journey for the frontier settlements on the 27th of August, and certainly a more ragamuffin cavalcade never was seen on the banks of the upper Arkansas. Of the large and fine horses with which we had left the frontier in the spring, not one remained. We had supplied their place with the rough breed of the prairie, as hardy as mules and almost as ugly. We had also with us a number of the latter detestable animals. In spite of their strength and hardihood, several of the band were already worn down by hard service and hard fare, and as none of them were shod, they were fast becoming footsore. Every horse and mule had a cord of twisted bullhide coiled around his neck, which by no means added to the beauty of his appearance. Our saddles and all our equipments were by this time lamentably worn and battered, and our weapons had become dull and rusty. The dress of the riders fully corresponded with the dilapidated furniture of our horses, and of the whole party none made a more disreputable appearance than my friend and I. Shaw had for an upper garment an old red flannel shirt flying open in front and belted around him like a frock, while I, in absence of other clothing, was attired in a time-worn suit of leather. Thus, happy and careless as so many beggars, we crept slowly from day to day along the monotonous banks of the Arkansas. Tete Rouge gave constant trouble, for he could never catch his mule, saddle her, or indeed do anything else without assistance. Every day he had some new ailment, real or imaginary, to complain of. At one moment he would be woebegone and disconsolate and the next he would be visited with a violent flow of spirits to which he could only give vent by incessant laughing, whistling, and telling stories. When other resources failed, we used to amuse ourselves by tormenting him, a fair compensation for the trouble he cost us. Tete Rouge rather enjoyed being laughed at, for he was an odd compound of weakness, eccentricity, and good nature. He made a figure worthy of a painter as he paced along before us, perched on the back of his mule and enveloped in a huge buffalo robe coat, which some charitable person had given him at the fort. This extraordinary garment, which would have contained two men of his size, he chose, for some reason best known to himself, to wear inside out, and he never took it off, even in the hottest weather. It was fluttering all over with seams and tatters, and the hide was so old and rotten that it broke out every day in a new place. Just at the top of it a large pile of red curls was visible, with his little cap set jauntily upon one side to give him a military air. His seat in the saddle was no less remarkable than his person and equipment. He pressed one leg close against his mule's side, and thrust the other out at an angle of forty-five degrees. His pantaloons were decorated with a military red stripe of which he was extremely vain, but being much too short, the whole length of his boots was usually visible below them. His blanket, loosely rolled up into a large bundle, dangled at the back of his saddle, where he carried it tied with a string. Four or five times a day it would fall to the ground. Every few minutes he would drop his pipe, his knife, his flint and steel, or a piece of tobacco, and have to scramble down to pick them up. In doing this he would contrive to get in everybody's way, and as the most of the party were by no means remarkable for a fastidious choice of language, a storm of anathemas would be showered upon him, half in earnest and half in jest, until Tete Rouge would declare that there was no comfort in life and that he never saw such fellows before. Only a day or two after leaving Bent's fort, Henry Chatillon rode forward to hunt and took Ellis along with him. After they had been some time absent, we saw them coming down the hill, driving three dragoon horses which had escaped from their owners on the march, or perhaps had given out and been abandoned. One of them was in tolerable condition, but the others were much emaciated and severely bitten by the wolves. Reduced as they were, we carried two of them to the settlements, and Henry exchanged the third with the Arapahoes for an excellent mule. On the day after, when we had stopped to rest at noon, a long train of Santa Fe wagons came up and trailed slowly past us in their picturesque procession. They belonged to a trader named Magoffin, whose brother, with a number of other men, came over and sat down around us on the grass. The news they brought was not of the most pleasing complexion. According to their accounts, the trail below was in a very dangerous state. 
they had repeatedly detected indians prowling at night around their camps and the large party which had left bent's fort a few weeks previous to our own departure had been attacked and a man named swan from massachusetts had been killed his companions had buried the body but when mcgoffin found his grave which was near a place called the caches the indians had dug up and scalped him and the wolves had shockingly mangled his remains as an offset to this intelligence, they gave us the welcome information that the buffalo were numerous at a few days' journey below. On the next afternoon, as we moved along the bank of the river, we saw the white tops of wagons on the horizon. It was some hours before we met them, when they proved to be a train of clumsy ox wagons, quite different from the rakish vehicles of the Santa Fe traders, and loaded with government stores for the troops. They all stopped, and the drivers gathered around us in a crowd. I thought that the whole frontier might have been ransacked in vain to furnish men worse fitted to meet the dangers of the prairie. Many of them were mere boys, fresh from the plough, and devoid of knowledge and experience. In respect to the state of the trail, they confirmed all that the Santa Fe men had told us. In passing between the Pawnee Fork and the Caches, their sentinels had fired every night at real or imaginary Indians. They said also that Ewing, a young Kentuckian in the party that had gone down before us, had shot an Indian who was prowling at evening about the camp. Some of them advised us to turn back, and others to hasten forward as fast as we could. But they all seemed in such a state of feverish anxiety, and so little capable of cool judgment, that we attached slight weight to what they said. They next gave us a more definite piece of intelligence. A large village of Arapahoes was encamped on the river below. They represented them to be quite friendly, but some distinction was to be made between a party of thirty men traveling with oxen, which were of no value in an Indian's eyes, and a mere handful like ourselves with a tempting band of mules and horses. This story of the Arapahoes, therefore, caused us some anxiety. Just after leaving the government wagons, as Shaw and I were riding along a narrow passage between the river bank and a rough hill that pressed close upon it, we heard Tete Rouge's voice behind us. Hello, he called out. I say, stop the cart just for a minute, will you? What's the matter, Tete? asked Shaw, as he came riding up to us with a grin of exultation. He had a bottle of molasses in one hand, and a large bundle of hides on the saddle before him, containing, as he triumphantly informed us, sugar, biscuits, coffee, and rice. These supplies he had obtained by a stratagem on which he greatly plumed himself, and he was extremely vexed and astonished that we did not fall in with his views of the matter. He had told Coates, the master wagoner, that the commissary at the fort had given him an order for sick rations, directed to the master of any government train which he might meet upon the road. This order he had unfortunately lost, but he hoped that the rations would not be refused on that account, as he was suffering from coarse fare and needed them very much. As soon as he came to camp that night, Tete Rouge repaired to the box at the back of the cart where Delorier used to keep his culinary apparatus, took possession of a saucepan, and after building a little fire of his own, set to work preparing a meal out of his ill-gotten booty. This done, he seized on a tin plate and spoon and sat down under the cart to regale himself. His preliminary repast did not at all prejudice his subsequent exertions at supper, where, in spite of his miniature dimensions, he made a better figure than any of us. Indeed, about this time his appetite grew quite voracious. He began to thrive wonderfully. His small body visibly expanded, and his cheeks, which when we first took him were rather yellow and cadaverous, now dilated in a wonderful manner, and became ruddy in proportion. Tete Rouge, in short, began to appear like another man. Early in the afternoon of the next day, looking along the edge of the horizon in front, we saw that at one point it was faintly marked with pale indentations like the teeth of a saw the lodges of the arapahoes rising between us and the sky caused this singular appearance it wanted still two or three hours of sunset when we came opposite their camp there were full two hundred lodges standing in the midst of a grassy meadow at some distance beyond the river while for a mile around and on either bank of the arkansas were scattered some fifteen hundred horses and mules grazing together in bands or wandering singly about the prairie 
the whole were visible at once for the vast expanse was unbroken by hills and there was not a tree or a bush to intercept the view here and there walked an indian engaged in watching the horses no sooner did we see them than tete rouge begged deloria to stop the cart and hand him his little military jacket which was stowed away there in this he instantly invested himself having for once laid the old buffalo coat aside assumed a most martial posture in the saddle set his cap over his left eye with an air of defiance and earnestly entreated that somebody would lend him a gun or a pistol for only half an hour being called upon to explain these remarkable proceedings tete rouge observed that he knew from experience what effect the presence of a military man in his uniform always had upon the mind of an indian and he thought the arapahoes ought to know that there was a soldier in the party meeting arapahoes here on the arkansas was a very different thing from meeting the same indians among their native mountains there was another circumstance in our favor general kearney had seen them a few weeks before as he came up the river with his army and renewing his threats of the previous year he told them that if they ever again touched the hair of a white man's head he would exterminate their nation this placed them for the time in an admirable frame of mind and the effect of his menaces had not yet disappeared i was anxious to see the village and its inhabitants we thought it also our best policy to visit them openly as if unsuspicious of any hostile design and shaw and i with henry chatillon prepared to cross the river the rest of the party meanwhile moved forward as fast as they could in order to get as far as possible from our suspicious neighbors before night came on the arkansas at this point and for several hundred miles below is nothing but a broad sand bed over which a few scanty threads of water are swiftly gliding now and then expanding into wide shallows at several places during the autumn the water sinks into the sand and disappears altogether at this season were it not for the numerous quicksands the river might be forded almost anywhere without difficulty though its channel is often a quarter of a mile wide our horses jumped down the bank and wading through the water or galloping freely over the hard sand beds soon reached the other side here as we were pushing through the tall grass we saw several indians not far off one of them waited until we came up and stood for some moments in perfect silence before us looking at us askance with his little snake-like eyes henry explained by signs what we wanted and the indian gathering his buffalo robe about his shoulders led the way toward the village without speaking a word the language of the arapahoes is so difficult and its pronunciation is so harsh and guttural that no white man it is said has ever been able to master it even maxwell the trader who has been most among them is compelled to resort to the curious sign language common to most of the prairie tribes with this henry chatillon was perfectly acquainted approaching the village we found the ground all around it strewn with great piles of waste buffalo meat in incredible quantities the lodges were pitched in a very wide circle they resembled those of the dakota in everything but cleanliness and neatness passing between two of them we entered the great circular area of the camp and instantly hundreds of indians men women and children came flocking out of their habitations to look at us at the same time the dogs all around the village set up a fearful baying our indian guide walked toward the lodge of the chief here we dismounted and loosening the trail ropes from our horses necks held them securely and sat down before the entrance with our rifles laid across our laps the chief came out and shook us by the hand he was a mean-looking fellow very tall thin-visaged and sinewy like the rest of the nation and with scarcely a vestige of clothing we had not been seated half a minute before a multitude of indians came crowding around us from every part of the village and we were shut in by a dense wall of savage faces some of the indians crouched around us on the ground others again sat behind them others stooping looked over their heads while many more stood crowded behind stretching themselves upward and peering over each other's shoulders to get a view of us I looked in vain among this multitude of faces to discover one manly or generous expression. All were wolfish, sinister, and malignant, and their complexions as well as their features, unlike those of the Dakota, were exceedingly bad. 
The chief, who sat close to the entrance, called to a squaw within the lodge, who soon came out and placed a wooden bowl of meat before us. To our surprise, however, no pipe was offered. Having tasted of the meat as a matter of form, I began to open a bundle of presents, tobacco, knives, vermilion, and other articles which I had brought with me. At this there was a grin on every countenance in the rapacious crowd. Their eyes began to glitter, and long thin arms were eagerly stretched toward us on all sides to receive the gifts. The Arapahoes set great value upon their shields, which they transmit carefully from father to son. I wished to get one of them, and displaying a large piece of scarlet cloth together with some tobacco and a knife, I offered them to any one who would bring me what I wanted. After some delay a tolerable shield was produced. They were very anxious to know what we meant to do with it, and Henry told them that we were going to fight their enemies, the Pawnees. This instantly produced a visible impression in our favor, which was increased by the distribution of the presents. Among these was a large paper of alls, a gift appropriate to the women, and as we were anxious to see the beauties of the Arapaho village, Henry requested that they might be called to receive them. A warrior gave a shout as if he were calling a pack of dogs together. The squaws, young and old, hags of eighty and girls of sixteen, came running with screams and laughter out of the lodges, and as the men gave way for them, they gathered round us and stretched out their arms, grinning with delight, their native ugliness considerably enhanced by the excitement of the moment. Mounting our horses, which during the whole interview we had held close to us, we prepared to leave the Arapahoes. The crowd fell back on each side and stood looking on. When we were half across the camp, an idea occurred to us. The Pawnees were probably in the neighborhood of the Caches. We might tell the Arapahoes of this and instigate them to send down a war party and cut them off, while we ourselves could remain behind for a while and hunt the buffalo. At first thought this plan of setting our enemies to destroy one another seemed to us a masterpiece of policy. But we immediately recollected that should we meet the Arapaho warriors on the river below, they might prove quite as dangerous as the Pawnees themselves. So, rejecting our plan as soon as it presented itself, we passed out of the village on the farther side. We urged our horses rapidly through the tall grass which rose to their necks. Several Indians were walking through it at a distance, their heads just visible above its waving surface. It bore a kind of seed as sweet and nutritious as oats, and our hungry horses, in spite of whip and rein, could not resist the temptation of snatching at this unwanted luxury as we passed along. When about a mile from the village, I turned and looked back over the undulating ocean of grass. The sun was just set, the western sky was all in a glow, and sharply defined against it on the extreme verge of the plain stood the numerous lodges of the Arapaho camp. Reaching the bank of the river, we followed it for some distance farther until we discerned through the twilight the white covering of our little cart on the opposite bank. When we reached it, we found a considerable number of Indians there before us. Four or five of them were seated in a row upon the ground, looking like so many half-starved vultures. Tete Rouge, in his uniform, was holding a close colloquy with another by the side of the cart. His gesticulations, his attempts at sign-making, and the contortions of his countenance were most ludicrous, and finding all these of no avail, he tried to make the Indian understand him by repeating English words very loudly and distinctly again and again. The Indian sat with his eye fixed steadily upon him, and in spite of the rigid immobility of his features, it was clear at a glance that he perfectly understood his military companion's character and thoroughly despised him. The exhibition was more amusing than politic, and Tete Rouge was directed to finish what he had to say as soon as possible. Thus rebuked, he crept under the cart and sat down there. Henry Chatillon stopped to look at him in his retirement and remarked in his quiet manner that an Indian would kill ten such men and laugh all the time. One by one our visitors rose and stalked away. As the darkness thickened, we were saluted by dismal sounds. The wolves are incredibly numerous in this part of the country, and the offal around the Arapaho camp had drawn such multitudes of them together that several hundred were howling in concert in our immediate neighborhood. There was an island in the river, or rather an oasis in the midst of the sands, at about the distance of a gunshot, 
and here they seemed gathered in the greatest numbers. A horrible discord of low mournful wailings, mingled with ferocious howls, arose from it incessantly for several hours after sunset. We could distinctly see the wolves running about the prairie within a few rods of our fire, or bounding over the sand beds of the river and splashing through the water. There was not the slightest danger to be feared from them, for they are the greatest cowards on the prairie. In respect to the human wolves in our neighborhood, we felt much less at ease. We seldom erected our tent except in bad weather, and that night each man spread his buffalo robe upon the ground with his loaded rifle laid at his side or clasped in his arms. Our horses were picketed so close around us that one of them repeatedly stepped over me as I lay. We were not in the habit of placing a guard, but every man that night was anxious and watchful. There was little sound sleeping in camp, and some one of the party was on his feet during the greater part of the time. For myself, I lay alternately waking and dozing until midnight. Tete Rouge was reposing close to the river bank, and about this time, when half asleep and half awake, I was conscious that he shifted his position and crept on all fours under the cart. Soon after, I fell into a sound sleep, from which I was aroused by a hand shaking me by the shoulder. Looking up, I saw Tete Rouge stooping over me with his face quite pale and his eyes dilated to their utmost expansion. "'What's the matter?' said I. Tete Rouge declared that as he lay on the river bank, something caught his eye which excited his suspicions. So, creeping under the cart for safety's sake, he sat there and watched, when he saw two Indians wrapped in white robes creep up the bank, seize upon two horses and lead them off. He looked so frightened and told his story in such a disconnected manner that I did not believe him, and was unwilling to alarm the party. Still, it might be true, and in that case the matter required instant attention. There would be no time for examination, and so, directing Tete Rouge to show me which way the Indians had gone, I took my rifle, in obedience to a thoughtless impulse, and left the camp. I followed the river back for two or three hundred yards, listening and looking anxiously on every side. In the dark prairie on the right I could discern nothing to excite alarm, and in the dusky bed of the river a wolf was bounding along in a manner which no Indian could imitate. I returned to the camp, and when within sight of it saw that the whole party was aroused. Shaw called out to me that he had counted the horses and that every one of them was in his place. Tete Rouge, being examined as to what he had seen, only repeated his former story with many asseverations and insisted the two horses were certainly carried off. At this Jim Gurney declared that he was crazy. Tete Rouge indignantly denied the charge, on which Jim appealed to us. As we declined to give our judgment on so delicate a matter, the dispute grew hot between Tete Rouge and his accuser, until he was directed to go to bed and not alarm the camp again if he saw the whole Arapaho village coming. End of chapter 23「The country before us was now thronged with buffalo, and a sketch of the manner of hunting them will not be out of place. There are two methods commonly practiced, running and approaching. The chase on horseback, which goes by the name of running, is the more violent and dashing mode of the two. Indeed, of all American wild sports, this is the wildest. Once among the buffalo, the hunter, unless long use has made him familiar with the situation, dashes forward in utter recklessness and self-abandonment. He thinks of nothing, cares for nothing but the game. His mind is stimulated to the highest pitch, yet intensely concentrated on one object. In the midst of the flying herd, where the uproar and the dust are thickest, it never wavers for a moment. He drops the rein and abandons his horse to his furious career. He levels his gun. The report sounds faint amid the thunder of the buffalo, and when his wounded enemy leaps in vain fury upon him, his heart thrills with a feeling like the fierce delight of the battlefield.' 
a practiced and skillful hunter, well mounted, will sometimes kill five or six cows in a single chase, loading his gun again and again as his horse rushes through the tumult. An exploit like this is quite beyond the capacities of a novice. In attacking a small band of buffalo, or in separating a single animal from the herd and assailing it apart from the rest, there is less excitement and less danger. With a bold and well-trained horse, the hunter may ride so close to the buffalo that as they gallop side by side he may reach over and touch him with his hand. Nor is there much danger in this, as long as the buffalo's strength and breath continue unabated. But when he becomes tired and can no longer run at ease, when his tongue lolls out and foam flies from his jaws, then the hunter had better keep at a more respectful distance. The distressed brute may turn upon him at any instant, and especially at the moment when he fires his gun. The wounded buffalo springs at his enemy, the horse leaps violently aside, and then the hunter has need of a tenacious seat in the saddle, for if he is thrown to the ground, there is no hope for him. When he sees his attack defeated, the buffalo resumes his flight, but if the shot be well directed, he soon stops, for a few moments he stands still, then totters and falls heavily upon the prairie. The chief difficulty in running buffalo, as it seems to me, is that of loading the gun or pistol at full gallop. Many hunters, for convenience sake, carry three or four bullets in the mouth. The powder is poured down the muzzle of the piece, the bullet dropped in after it, and the stock struck hard upon the pommel of the saddle, and the work is done. The danger of this method is obvious. Should the blow on the pommel fail to send the bullet home, or should the latter, in the act of aiming, start from its place and roll toward the muzzle, the gun would probably burst in discharging. Many a shattered hand, and worse casualties besides, have been the result of such an accident. To obviate it, some hunters make use of a ramrod, usually hung by a string from the neck, but this materially increases the difficulty of loading. The bows and arrows which the Indians use in running buffalo have many advantages over firearms, and even white men occasionally employ them. The danger of the chase arises not so much from the onset of the wounded animal as from the nature of the ground which the hunter must ride over. The prairie does not always present a smooth, level, and uniform surface. Very often it is broken with hills and hollows, intersected by ravines, and in the remoter parts studded by the stiff wild sage bushes. The most formidable obstructions, however, are the burrows of wild animals, wolves, badgers, and particularly prairie dogs, with whose holes the ground for a very great extent is frequently honeycombed. In the blindness of the chase, the hunter rushes over it unconscious of danger. His horse, at full career, thrusts his leg deep into one of the burrows, the bone snaps, the rider is hurled forward to the ground, and probably killed. Yet accidents in buffalo running happen less frequently than one would suppose. In the recklessness of the chase, the hunter enjoys all the impunity of a drunken man, and may ride in safety over the gullies and declivities, where, should he attempt to pass in his sober senses, he would infallibly break his neck. The method of approaching, being practiced on foot, has many advantages over that of running. In the former, one neither breaks down his horse nor endangers his own life. Instead of yielding to excitement, he must be cool, collected, and watchful. He must understand the buffalo, observe the features of the country and the course of the wind, and be well skilled, moreover, in using the rifle. The buffalo are strange animals. Sometimes they are so stupid and infatuated that a man may walk up to them in full sight on the open prairie, and even shoot several of their number before the rest will think it necessary to retreat. Again at another moment they will be so shy and wary that in order to approach them the utmost skill, experience, and judgment are necessary. Kit Carson, I believe, stands preeminent in running buffalo. In approaching, no man living can bear away the palm from Henry Chatelot. To resume the story. After Tete Rouge had alarmed the camp, no further disturbance occurred during the night. The Arapahoes did not attempt mischief, or if they did, the wakefulness of the party deterred them from effecting their purpose. The next day was one of activity and excitement. For about ten o'clock, the men in advance shouted the gladdening cry of, Buffalo! Buffalo! And in the hollow of the prairie just below us, a band of bulls were grazing. 
The temptation was irresistible, and Shaw and I rode down upon them. We were badly mounted on our traveling horses, but by hard lashing we overtook them, and Shaw, running alongside of a bull, shot into him both balls of his double-barreled gun. Looking round as I galloped past, I saw the bull in his mortal fury rushing again and again upon his antagonist, whose horse constantly leaped aside and avoided the onset. My chase was more protracted, but at length I ran close to the bull and killed him with my pistols. Cutting off the tails of our victims by way of trophy, we rejoined the party in about a quarter of an hour after we left it. Again and again that morning rang out the same welcome cry of, Buffalo! Buffalo! Every few moments in the broad meadows along the river we would see bands of bulls, who, raising their shaggy heads, would gaze in stupid amazement at the approaching horsemen, and then, breaking into a clumsy gallop, would file off in a long line across the trail in front, toward the rising prairie on the left. At noon the whole plain before us was alive with thousands of buffalo, bulls, cows, and calves, all moving rapidly as we drew near and far off beyond the river the swelling prairie was darkened with them to the very horizon. The party was in gayer spirits than ever. We stopped for a nooning near a grove of trees by the riverside. "'Tongues and hump ribs to-morrow,' said Shaw, looking with contempt at the venison steaks which Deloria placed before us. Our meal finished, we lay down under a temporary awning to sleep. A shout from Henry Chatillon aroused us, and we saw him standing on the cartwheel, stretching his tall figure to its full height, while he looked toward the prairie beyond the river. Following the direction of his eyes, we could clearly distinguish a large dark object, like the black shadow of a cloud, passing rapidly over swell after swell of the distant plain. Behind it followed another of similar appearance, though smaller. Its motion was more rapid, and it drew closer and closer to the first. It was the hunters of the Arapaho camp pursuing a band of buffalo. Shaw and I hastily sought and saddled our best horses, and went plunging through sand and water to the farther bank. We were too late. The hunters had already mingled with the herd, and the work of slaughter was nearly over. When we reached the ground, we found it strewn far and near with numberless black carcasses, while the remnants of the herd, scattered in all directions, were flying away in terror, and the Indians still rushing in pursuit. Many of the hunters, however, remained upon the spot, and among the rest was our yesterday's acquaintance, a chief of the village. He had alighted by the side of a cow into which he had shot five or six arrows, and his squaw, who had followed him on horseback to the hunt, was giving him a draught of water out of a canteen, purchased or plundered from some volunteer soldier. Recrossing the river, we overtook the party, who were already on their way. We had scarcely gone a mile when an imposing spectacle presented itself. From the river bank on the right, away over the swelling prairie on the left, and in front as far as we could see, extended one vast host of buffalo. The outskirts of the herd were within a quarter of a mile. In many parts they were crowded so densely together that in the distance their rounded backs presented a surface of uniform blackness. But elsewhere they were more scattered, and from amid the multitude rose little columns of dust where the buffalo were rolling on the ground. Here and there a great confusion was perceptible, where a battle was going forward among the bulls. We could distinctly see them rushing against each other, and hear the clattering of their horns and their horse bellowing. Shaw was riding at some distance in advance with Henry Chatillon. I saw him stop and draw the leather covering from his gun. Indeed, with such a sight before us, but one thing could be thought of. That morning I had used pistols in the chase. I had now a mind to try the virtue of a gun. Delorier had one, and I rode up to the side of the cart. There he sat under the white covering, biting his pipe between his teeth, and grinning with excitement. "'Lend me your gun, Delorier,' said I. "'Oui, monsieur, oui,' said Delorier, tugging with might and main to stop the mule, which seemed obstinately bent on going forward. Then everything but his moccasins disappeared as he crawled into the cart and pulled at the gun to extricate it. "'Is it loaded?' I asked. "'Oui, bien chargé.' You'll kill, mon bourgeois, yes, you'll kill. C'est un bon fusil. I handed him my rifle and rode forward to Shaw. 
"'Are you ready?' he asked. "'Come on,' said I. "'Keep down that hollow,' said Henry, "'and then they won't see you till you get close to them.' The hollow was a kind of ravine, very wide and shallow. It ran obliquely toward the buffalo, and we rode at a canter along the bottom until it became too shallow, when we bent close to our horses' necks, and then, finding that it could no longer conceal us, came out of it and rode directly toward the herd. It was within gunshot. Before its outskirts, numerous grisly old bulls were scattered, holding guard over their females. They glared at us in anger and astonishment, walked toward us a few yards, and then, turning slowly round, retreated at a trot, which afterward broke into a clumsy gallop. In an instant, the main body caught the alarm. The buffalo began to crowd away from the point toward which we were approaching, and a gap was opened in the side of the herd. We entered it, still restraining our excited horses. Every instant the tumult was thickening. The buffalo, pressing together in large bodies, crowded away from us on every hand. In front and on either side we could see dark columns and masses, half hidden by clouds of dust, rushing along in terror and confusion, and hear the tramp and clattering of ten thousand hoofs. That countless multitude of powerful brutes, ignorant of their own strength, were flying in a panic from the approach of two feeble horsemen. To remain quiet longer was impossible. "'Take that band on the left,' said Shaw. "'I'll take these in front.' He sprang off, and I saw no more of him. A heavy Indian whip was fastened by a band to my wrist. I swung it into the air and lashed my horse's flank with all the strength of my arm. Away she darted, stretching close to the ground. I could see nothing but a cloud of dust before me, but I knew that it concealed a band of many hundreds of buffalo. In a moment I was in the midst of the cloud, half suffocated by the dust, and stunned by the trampling of the flying herd. But I was drunk with the chase, and cared for nothing but the buffalo. Very soon a long dark mass became visible, looming through the dust. Then I could distinguish each bulky carcass, the hoofs flying out beneath, the short tails held rigidly erect. In a moment I was so close that I could have touched them with my gun. Suddenly, to my utter amazement, the hoofs were jerked upward, the tails flourished in the air, and amid a cloud of dust the buffalo seemed to sink into the earth before me. One vivid impression of that instant remains upon my mind. I remember looking down the backs of several buffalo dimly visible through the dust. We had run unawares upon a ravine. At that moment I was not the most accurate judge of depth and width, but when I passed it on my return I found it about twelve feet deep and not quite twice as wide at the bottom. It was impossible to stop. I would have done so gladly if I could. So, half sliding, half plunging, down went the little mare. I believe she came down on her knees in the loose sand at the bottom. I was pitched forward violently against her neck and nearly thrown over her head among the buffalo, who amid dust and confusion came tumbling in all around. The mare was on her feet in an instant and scrambling like a cat up the opposite side. I thought for a moment that she would have fallen back and crushed me, but with a violent effort she clambered out and gained the hard prairie above. Glancing back, I saw the huge head of a bull clinging, as it were, by the forefeet at the edge of the dusty gulf. At length I was fairly among the buffalo. They were less densely crowded than before, and I could see nothing but bulls who always run at the rear of the herd. As I passed amid them, they would lower their heads, and turning as they ran, attempt to gore my horse, but as they were already at full speed, there was no force in their onset, and as Pauline ran faster than they, they were always thrown behind her in the effort. I soon began to distinguish cows amid the throng. One just in front of me seemed to my liking, and I pushed close to her side. Dropping the reins, I fired, holding the muzzle of the gun within a foot of her shoulder. Quick as lightning she sprang at Pauline. The little mare dodged the attack, and I lost sight of the wounded animal amid the tumultuous crowd. Immediately after I selected another, and urging forward Pauline, shot into her both pistols in succession. For a while I kept her in view, but in attempting to load my gun lost sight of her also in the confusion. Believing her to be mortally wounded and unable to keep up with the herd, I checked my horse. The crowd rushed onward. The dust and tumult passed away, and on the prairie far behind the rest I saw a solitary buffalo galloping heavily. In a moment I and my victim were running side by side. 
My firearms were all empty, and I had in my pouch nothing but rifle bullets, too large for the pistols and too small for the gun. I loaded the latter, however, but as often as I leveled it to fire, the little bullets would roll out of the muzzle and the gun returned only a faint report like a squib, as the powder harmlessly exploded. I galloped in front of the buffalo and attempted to turn her back, but her eyes glared, her mane bristled, and lowering her head she rushed at me with astonishing fierceness and activity. Again and again I rode before her, and again and again she repeated her furious charge. But little Pauline was in her element. She dodged her enemy at every rush, until at length the buffalo stood still, exhausted with her own efforts. She panted, and her tongue hung lolling from her jaws. Riding to a little distance, I alighted, thinking to gather a handful of dry grass to serve the purpose of wadding and load the gun at my leisure. No sooner were my feet on the ground than the buffalo came bounding in such a rage toward me that I jumped back again into the saddle with all possible dispatch. After waiting a few minutes more, I made an attempt to ride up and stab her with my knife, but the experiment proved such as no wise man would repeat. At length, bethinking me of the fringes at the seams of my buckskin pantaloons, I jerked off a few of them, and, reloading my gun, forced them down the barrel to keep the bullet in its place. Then approaching, I shot the wounded buffalo through the heart. Sinking to her knees, she rolled over lifeless on the prairie. To my astonishment, I found that instead of a fat cow, I had been slaughtering a stout yearling bull. No longer wondering at the fierceness he had shown, I opened his throat, and, cutting out his tongue, tied it at the back of my saddle. My mistake was one which a more experienced eye than mine might easily make in the dust and confusion of such a chase. Then, for the first time, I had leisure to look at the scene around me. The prairie in front was darkened with the retreating multitude, and on the other hand the buffalo came filing up in endless unbroken columns from the low plains upon the river. The Arkansas was three or four miles distant. I turned and moved slowly toward it. A long time passed before, far down in the distance, I distinguished the white covering of the cart and the little black specks of horsemen before and behind it. Drawing near, I recognized Shaw's elegant tunic, the red flannel shirt, conspicuous far off. I overtook the party and asked him what success he had met with. He had assailed a fat cow, shot her with two bullets, and mortally wounded her. But neither of us were prepared for the chase that afternoon, and Shaw, like myself, had no spare bullets in his pouch, so he abandoned the disabled animal to Henry Chatillon, who followed, dispatched her with his rifle, and loaded his horse with her meat. We encamped close to the river. The night was dark and as we lay down we could hear, mingled with the howling of wolves, the hoarse bellowing of the buffalo, like the ocean beating upon a distant coast. End of chapter 24THE OREGON TRAIL by Francis Parkman, Jr. CHAPTER Twenty Five, THE BUFFALO CAMP No one in the camp was more active than Jim Gurney, and no one half so lazy as Ellis. Between these two there was a great antipathy. Ellis never stirred in the morning until he was compelled to, but Jim was always on his feet before daybreak, and this morning, as usual, the sound of his voice awakened the party. "'Get up, you booby! Up with you now! You're fit for nothing but eating and sleeping. Stop your grumbling and come out of that buffalo robe or I'll pull it off for you.' Jim's words were interspersed with numerous expletives which gave them great additional effect. Ellis drawled out something in a nasal tone from among the folds of his buffalo robe, then slowly disengaged himself, rose into sitting posture, stretched his long arms, yawned hideously, and finally, raising his tall person erect, stood staring round him to all the four quarters of the horizon. Delorier's fire was soon blazing, and the horses and mules, loosened from their pickets, were feeding in the neighboring meadow. When we sat down to breakfast, the prairie was still in the dusky light of morning, and as the sun rose, we were mounted and on our way again. 
"'A white buffalo!' exclaimed Monroe. "'I'll have that fellow,' said Shaw, "'if I run my horse to death after him.' He threw the cover of his gun to Delorier and galloped out upon the prairie. "'Stop, Mr. Shaw, stop!' called out Henry Chatillon. "'You'll run down your horse for nothing. It's only a white ox.' But Shaw was already out of hearing. The ox, who had no doubt strayed away from some of the government wagon trains, was standing beneath some low hills which bounded the plain in the distance. Not far from him a band of veritable buffalo bulls were grazing, and startled at Shaw's approach, they all broke into a run and went scrambling up the hillsides to gain the high prairie above. One of them in his haste and terror involved himself in a fatal catastrophe. Along the foot of the hills was a narrow strip of deep marshy soil into which the bull plunged and hopelessly entangled himself. We all rode up to the spot. The huge carcass was half sunk in the mud which flowed to his very chin, and his shaggy mane was outspread upon the surface. As we came near, the bull began to struggle with convulsive strength. He writhed to and fro, and in the energy of his fright and desperation would lift himself for a moment half out of the slough, while the reluctant mire returned a sucking sound as he strained to drag his limbs from its tenacious depths. We stimulated his exertions by getting behind him and twisting his tail. Nothing would do. There was clearly no hope for him. After every effort his heaving sides were more deeply embedded, and the mire almost overflowed his nostrils. He lay still at length, and looking round at us with a furious eye, seemed to resign himself to his fate. Ellis slowly dismounted, and, deliberately leveling his boasted Jaeger, shot the old bull through the heart. Then he lazily climbed back again to his seat, pluming himself, no doubt, on having actually killed a buffalo. That day the invincible Jaeger drew blood for the first and last time during the whole journey. The morning was a bright and gay one, and the air so clear that on the farthest horizon the outline of the pale blue prairie was sharply drawn against the sky. Shaw felt in the mood for hunting. He rode in advance of the party, and before long we saw a file of bulls galloping at full speed upon a vast green swell of the prairie at some distance in front. Shaw came scouring along behind them, arrayed in his red shirt, which looked very well in the distance. He gained fast on the fugitives, and as the foremost bull was disappearing behind the summit of the swell, we saw him in the act of assailing the hindmost. A smoke sprang from the muzzle of his gun, and floated away before the wind like a little white cloud. The bull turned upon him, and just then the rising ground concealed them both from view. We were moving forward until about noon, when we stopped by the side of the Arkansas. At that moment Shaw appeared, riding slowly down the side of a distant hill. His horse was tired and jaded, and when he threw his saddle upon the ground, I observed that the tails of two bulls were dangling behind it. No sooner were the horses turned loose to feed than Henry, asking Monroe to go with him, took his rifle and walked quietly away. Shaw, Tete Rouge, and I sat down by the side of the cart to discuss the dinner which Delorier placed before us. We had scarcely finished when we saw Monroe walking toward us along the river bank. Henry, he said, had killed four fat cows, and had sent him back for horses to bring in the meat. Shaw took a horse for himself and another for Henry, and he and Monroe left the camp together. After a short absence, all three of them came back, their horses loaded with the choicest parts of the meat. We kept two of the cows for ourselves, and gave the others to Monroe and his companions. Delorier seated himself on the grass before the pile of meat, and worked industriously for some time to cut it into thin broad sheets for drying. This is no easy matter, but Delorier had all the skill of an Indian squaw. Long before night, cords of rawhide were stretched around the camp, and the meat was hung upon them to dry in the sunshine and pure air of the prairie. Our California companions were less successful at the work, but they accomplished it after their own fashion, and their side of the camp was soon garnished in the same manner as our own. We meant to remain at this place long enough to prepare provisions for our journey to the frontier, which, as we supposed, might occupy about a month. Had the distance been twice as great and the party ten times as large, the unerring rifle of Henry Chatillon would have supplied meat enough for the whole within two days. We were obliged to remain, however, until it should be dry enough for transportation. 
so we erected our tent and made the other arrangements for a permanent camp. The California men, who had no such shelter, contented themselves with arranging their packs on the grass around their fire. In the meantime, we had nothing to do but amuse ourselves. Our tent was within a rod of the river. If the broad sand beds with a scanty stream of water coursing here and there along their surface deserved to be dignified with the name of river, the vast flat plains on either side were almost on a level with the sand beds, and they were bounded in the distance by low monotonous hills parallel to the course of the Arkansas. All was one expanse of grass. There was no wood in view, except some trees and stunted bushes upon two islands which rose from amid the wet sands of the river. Yet far from being dull and tame, this boundless scene was often a wild and animated one. For twice a day, at sunrise and at noon, the buffalo came issuing from the hills, slowly advancing in their grave processions to drink at the river. All our amusements were, too, at their expense. Except an elephant, I have seen no animal that can surpass a buffalo bull in size and strength, and the world may be searched in vain to find anything of a more ugly and ferocious aspect. At first sight of him, every feeling of sympathy vanishes. No man who has not experienced it can understand with what keen relish one inflicts his death wound, with what profound contentment of mind he beholds him fall. The cows are much smaller and of a gentler appearance, as becomes their sex. While in this camp we forbore to attack them, leaving to Henry Chatillon, who could better judge their fatness and good quality, the task of killing such as we wanted for use, but against the bulls we waged an unrelenting war. Thousands of them might be slaughtered without causing any detriment to the species, for their numbers greatly exceed those of the cows. It is the hides of the latter alone which are used for purposes of commerce and for making the lodges of the Indians, and the destruction among them is therefore altogether disproportioned. Our horses were tired, and we now usually hunted on foot. The wide, flat sand beds of the Arkansas, as the reader will remember, lay close by the side of our camp. While we were lying on the grass after dinner, smoking, conversing, or laughing at Tete Rouge, one of us would look up and observe, far out on the plains beyond the river, certain black objects slowly approaching. He would inhale a parting whiff from the pipe, then, rising lazily, take his rifle, which leaned against the cart, throw over his shoulder the strap of his pouch and powder horn, and with his moccasins in his hand, walk quietly across the sand toward the opposite side of the river. This was very easy, for though the sands were about a quarter of a mile wide, the water was nowhere more than two feet deep. The farther bank was about four or five feet high and quite perpendicular, being cut away by the water in spring. Tall grass grew along its edge. Putting it aside with his hand and cautiously looking through it, the hunter can discern the huge shaggy back of the buffalo slowly swaying to and fro as with his clumsy swinging gait he advances toward the water. The buffalo have regular paths by which they come down to drink. Seeing at a glance along which of these his intended victim is moving, the hunter crouches under the bank within fifteen or twenty yards, it may be, of the point where the path enters the river. Here he sits down quietly on the sand. Listening intently, he hears the heavy, monotonous tread of the approaching bull. The moment after, he sees a motion among the long weeds and grass just at the spot where the path is channeled through the bank. An enormous black head is thrust out, the horns just visible amid the mass of tangled mane. Half sliding, half plunging, down comes the buffalo upon the river bed below. He steps out in full sight upon the sands. Just before him a runnel of water is gliding, and he bends his head to drink. You may hear the water as it gurgles down his capacious throat. He raises his head, and the drops trickle from his wet beard. He stands with an air of stupid abstraction, unconscious of the lurking danger. Noiselessly the hunter cocks his rifle. As he sits upon the sand, his knee is raised and his elbow rests upon it that he may level his heavy weapon with a steadier aim. The stock is at his shoulder. His eye ranges along the barrel. Still he is in no haste to fire. The bull with slow deliberation begins his march over the sands to the other side. 
he advances his foreleg and exposes to view a small spot denuded of hair just behind the point of his shoulder. Upon this the hunter brings the sight of his rifle to bear. Lightly and delicately his finger presses upon the hair trigger. Quick as thought the spiteful crack of the rifle responds to his slight touch, and instantly in the middle of the bare spot appears a small red dot. The buffalo shivers. Death has overtaken him. He cannot tell from whence. Still, he does not fall, but walks heavily forward, as if nothing had happened. Yet before he has advanced far out upon the sand, you see him stop. He totters. His knees bend under him, and his head sinks forward to the ground. Then his whole vast bulk sways to one side. He rolls over on the sand and dies with a scarcely perceptible struggle. Waylaying the buffalo in this manner and shooting them as they come to water is the easiest and laziest method of hunting them. They may also be approached by crawling up ravines or behind hills or even over the open prairie. This is often surprisingly easy, but at other times it requires the utmost skill of the most experienced hunter. Henry Chatillon was a man of extraordinary strength and hardihood, but I have seen him return to camp quite exhausted with his efforts, his limbs scratched and wounded, and his buckskin dress stuck full of thorns of the prickly pear among which he had been crawling. Sometimes he would lay flat upon his face and drag himself along in this position for many rods together. On the second day of our stay at this place, Henry went out for an afternoon hunt. Shaw and I remained in camp until, observing some bulls approaching the water upon the other side of the river, we crossed over to attack them. They were so near, however, that before we could get under cover of the bank our appearance as we walked over the sands alarmed them. Turning round before coming within gunshot, they began to move off to the right in a direction parallel to the river. I climbed up the bank and ran after them. They were walking swiftly, and before I could come within gunshot distance, they slowly wheeled about and faced toward me. Before they had turned far enough to see me, I had fallen flat on my face. For a moment they stood and stared at the strange object upon the grass. Then, turning away, again they walked on as before, and I, rising immediately, ran once more in pursuit. Again they wheeled about, and again I fell prostrate. Repeating this three or four times, I came at length within a hundred yards of the fugitives, and as I saw them turning again, I sat down and leveled my rifle. The one in the center was the largest I had ever seen. I shot him behind the shoulder. His two companions ran off. He attempted to follow, but soon came to a stand, and at length lay down as quietly as an ox chewing the cud. Cautiously approaching him, I saw by his dull and jelly-like eye that he was dead. When I began the chase, the prairie was almost tenantless, but a great multitude of buffalo had suddenly thronged upon it, and looking up, I saw within fifty rods a heavy, dark column stretching to the right and left as far as I could see. I walked toward them. My approach did not alarm them in the least. The column itself consisted entirely of cows and calves, but a great many old bulls were ranging about the prairie on its flank, and as I drew near, they faced toward me with such a shaggy and ferocious look that I thought it best to proceed no farther. Indeed, I was already within close rifle shot of the column, and I sat down on the ground to watch their movements. Sometimes the whole would stand still, their heads all facing one way. Then they would trot forward as if by a common impulse, their hoofs and horns clattering together as they moved. I soon began to hear at a distance on the left the sharp reports of a rifle, again and again repeated. And not long after, dull and heavy sounds succeeded, which I recognized as the familiar voice of Shaw's double-barreled gun. When Henry's rifle was at work, there was always meat to be brought in. I went back across the river for a horse, and returning, reached the spot where the hunters were standing. The buffalo were visible on the distant prairie. The living had retreated from the ground, but ten or twelve carcasses were scattered in various directions. Henry, knife in hand, was stooping over a dead cow, cutting away the best and fattest of the meat. When Shaw left me, he had walked down for some distance under the river bank to find another bull. At length he saw the plains covered with a host of buffalo, 
and soon after heard the crack of Henry's rifle. Ascending the bank, he crawled through the grass, which for a rod or two from the river was very high and rank. He had not crawled far before, to his astonishment, he saw Henry standing erect upon the prairie, almost surrounded by the buffalo. Henry was in his appropriate element. Nelson, on the deck of the victory, hardly felt a prouder sense of mastery than he. Quite unconscious that anyone was looking at him, he stood at the full height of his tall, strong figure, one hand resting upon his side and the other arm leaning carelessly on the muzzle of his rifle. His eyes were ranging over the singular assemblage around him. Now and then he would select such a cow as suited him, level his rifle and shoot her dead. Then, quietly reloading, he would resume his former position. The buffalo seemed no more to regard his presence than if he were one of themselves. The bulls were bellowing and butting at each other, or else rolling about in the dust. A group of buffalo would gather about the carcass of a dead cow, snuffing at her wounds, and sometimes they would come behind those that had not yet fallen and endeavor to push them from the spot. Now and then some old bull would face toward Henry with an air of stupid amazement, but none seemed inclined to attack or fly from him. For some time Shaw lay among the grass, looking in surprise at this extraordinary sight. At length he crawled cautiously forward and spoke in a low voice to Henry, who told him to rise and come on. Still the buffalo showed no sign of fear. They remained gathered about their dead companions. Henry had already killed as many cows as we wanted for use, and Shaw, kneeling behind one of the carcasses, shot five bulls before the rest thought it necessary to disperse. The frequent stupidity and infatuation of the buffalo seems the more remarkable from the contrast it offers to their wildness and wariness at other times. Henry knew all their peculiarities. He had studied them as a scholar studies his books, and he derived quite as much pleasure from the occupation. The buffalo were a kind of companions to him, and, as he said, he never felt alone when they were about him. He took great pride in his skill in hunting. Henry was one of the most modest of men, yet in the simplicity and frankness of his character it was quite clear that he looked upon his preeminence in this respect as a thing too palpable and well established ever to be disputed. But whatever may have been his estimate of his own skill, it was rather below than above that which others placed upon it. The only time that I ever saw a shade of scorn darken his face was when two volunteer soldiers, who had just killed a buffalo for the first time, undertook to instruct him as to the best method of approaching. To borrow an illustration from an opposite side of life, an Eton boy might as well have sought to enlighten Porson on the formation of a Greek verb, or a Fleet Street shopkeeper to instruct Chesterfield concerning a point of etiquette. Henry always seemed to think that he had a sort of prescriptive right to the buffalo, and to look upon them as something belonging peculiarly to himself. Nothing excited his indignation so much as any wanton destruction committed among the cows, and in his view shooting a calf was a cardinal sin. Henry Chatillon and Tete Rouge were the same age, that is, about thirty. Henry was twice as large and fully six times as strong as Tete Rouge. Henry's face was roughened by winds and storms. Tete Rouge's was bloated by sherry cobblers and brandy toddy. Henry talked of Indians and buffalo. Tete Rouge of theaters and oyster cellars. Henry had led a life of hardship and privation. Tete Rouge never had a whim which he would not gratify at the first moment he was able. Henry, moreover, was the most disinterested man I ever saw while Tete Rouge, though equally good-natured in his way, cared for nobody but himself. Yet we would not have lost him on any account. He admirably served the purpose of a jester in a feudal castle. Our camp would have been lifeless without him. For the past week he had fattened in a most amazing manner, and indeed this was not at all surprising, since his appetite was most inordinate. He was eating from morning till night. Half the time he would be at work cooking some private repast for himself, and he paid a visit to the coffee-pot eight or ten times a day. His rueful and disconsolate face became jovial and rubicund, his eyes stood out like a lobster's, and his spirits, which before were sunk to the depths of despondency, were now elated in proportion. 
All day he was singing, whistling, laughing, and telling stories. Being mortally afraid of Jim Gurney, he kept close in the neighborhood of our tent. As he had seen an abundance of low, dissipated life and had a considerable fund of humor, his anecdotes were extremely amusing, especially since he never hesitated to place himself in a ludicrous point of view, provided he could raise a laugh by doing so. Tete Rouge, however, was sometimes rather troublesome. He had an inveterate habit of pilfering provisions at all times of the day. He set ridicule at utter defiance, and being without a particle of self-respect, he would never have given over his tricks, even if they had drawn upon him the scorn of the whole party. Now and then, indeed, something worse than laughter fell to his share. On these occasions he would exhibit much contrition, but half an hour after we would generally observe him stealing round to the box at the back of the cart and slyly making off with the provisions which Delorier had laid by for supper. He was very fond of smoking, but having no tobacco of his own, we used to provide him with as much as he wanted, a small piece at a time. At first we gave him half a pound together, but this experiment proved an entire failure, for he invariably lost not only the tobacco, but the knife entrusted to him for cutting it and a few minutes after he would come to us with many apologies and beg for more. We had been two days at this camp, and some of the meat was nearly fit for transportation, when a storm came suddenly upon us. About sunset the whole sky grew as black as ink, and the long grass at the river's edge bent and rose mournfully with the first gusts of the approaching hurricane. Monroe and his two companions brought their guns and placed them under cover of our tent. Having no shelter for themselves, they built a fire of driftwood that might have defied a cataract, and wrapped in their buffalo robes, sat on the ground around it to bide the fury of the storm. Delorier ensconced himself under the cover of the cart. Shaw and I, together with Henry and Tete Rouge, crowded into the little tent, but first of all the dried meat was piled together and well protected by buffalo robes pinned firmly to the ground. About nine o'clock the storm broke, amid absolute darkness. It blew a gale, and torrents of rain roared over the boundless expanse of open prairie. Our tent was filled with mist and spray beating through the canvas and saturating everything within. We could only distinguish each other at short intervals by the dazzling flash of lightning, which displayed the whole waste around us with its momentary glare. We had our fears for the tent, but for an hour or two it stood fast, until at length the cap gave way before a furious blast, the pole tore through the top, and in an instant we were half suffocated by the cold and dripping folds of the canvas which fell down upon us. Seizing upon our guns, we placed them erect in order to lift the saturated cloth above our heads. In this disagreeable situation, involved among wet blankets and buffalo robes, we spent several hours of the night, during which the storm would not abate for a moment, but pelted down above our heads with merciless fury. Before long the ground beneath us became soaked with moisture, and the water gathered there in a pool two or three inches deep, so that for a considerable part of the night we were partially immersed in a cold bath. In spite of all this, Tete Rouge's flow of spirits did not desert him for an instant. He laughed, whistled, and sung in defiance of the storm, and that night he paid off the long arrears of ridicule which he owed us. While we lay in silence, enduring the infliction with what philosophy we could muster, Tete Rouge, who was intoxicated with animal spirits, was cracking jokes at our expense by the hour together. At about three o'clock in the morning, preferring the tyranny of the open night to such a wretched shelter, we crawled out from beneath the fallen canvas. The wind had abated, but the rain fell steadily. The fire of the California men still blazed amid the darkness, and we joined them as they sat around it. We made ready some hot coffee by way of refreshment, but when some of the party sought to replenish their cups, it was found that Tete Rouge, having disposed of his own share, had privately abstracted the coffee pot and drank up the rest of the contents out of the spout. In the morning, to our great joy, an unclouded sun rose upon the prairie. We presented rather a laughable appearance, for the cold and clammy buckskin saturated with water clung fast to our limbs. The light wind and warm sunshine soon dried them again, and then we were all encased in armor of intolerable rigidity. 
roaming all day over the prairie and shooting two or three bulls were scarcely enough to restore the stiffened leather to its usual pliancy. Besides Henry Chatillon, Shaw and I were the only hunters in the party. Monroe this morning made an attempt to run a buffalo, but his horse could not come up to the game. Shaw went out with him, and being better mounted soon found himself in the midst of the herd. Seeing nothing but cows and calves around him, he checked his horse. An old bull came galloping on the open prairie at some distance behind, and turning, Shaw rode across his path, leveling his gun as he passed, and shooting him through the shoulder into the heart. The heavy bullets of Shaw's double-barreled gun made wild work wherever they struck. A great flock of buzzards were usually soaring about a few trees that stood on the island just below our camp. Throughout the whole of yesterday we had noticed an eagle among them. Today he was still there, and Tent Rouge, declaring that he would kill the bird of America, borrowed Deloria's gun and set out on his unpatriotic mission. As might have been expected, the eagle suffered no great harm at his hands. He soon returned, saying that he could not find him, but had shot a buzzard instead. Being required to produce the bird in proof of his assertion, he said he believed he was not quite dead, but he must be hurt from the swiftness with which he flew off. "'If you want,' said Tete Rouge, "'I'll go out and get one of his feathers. I knocked off plenty of them when I shot him.' Just opposite our camp was another island covered with bushes, and behind it was a deep pool of water, while two or three considerable streams coursed over the sand not far off. I was bathing at this place in the afternoon when a white wolf, larger than the largest Newfoundland dog, ran out from behind the point of the island and galloped leisurely over the sand not half a stone's throw distant. I could plainly see his red eyes and the bristles about his snout. He was an ugly scoundrel with a bushy tail, large head, and a most repulsive countenance. Having neither rifle to shoot nor stone to pelt him with, I was looking eagerly after some missile for his benefit when the report of a gun came from the camp, and the ball threw up the sand just beyond him. At this he gave a slight jump and stretched away so swiftly that he soon dwindled into a mere speck on the distant sand beds. The number of carcasses that by this time were lying about the prairie all around us summoned the wolves from every quarter. The spot where Shaw and Henry had hunted together soon became their favorite resort, for here about a dozen dead buffalo were fermenting under the hot sun. I used often to go over the river and watch them at their meal. By lying under the bank it was easy to get a full view of them. Three different kinds were present. There were the white wolves and the gray wolves, both extremely large, and beside these the small prairie wolves, not much bigger than spaniels. They would howl and fight in a crowd around a single carcass, yet they were so watchful and their senses so acute that I never was able to crawl within a fair shooting distance. Whenever I attempted it, they would all scatter at once and glide silently away through the tall grass. The air above this spot was always full of buzzards or black vultures. Whenever the wolves left a carcass, they would descend upon it and cover it so densely that a rifle bullet shot at random among the gormandizing crowd would generally strike down two or three of them. These birds would now be sailing by scores just about our camp, their broad black wings seeming half transparent as they expanded them against the bright sky. The wolves and the buzzards thickened about us with every hour, and two or three eagles also came into the feast. I killed a bull within rifle shot of the camp. That night the wolves made a fearful howling close at hand, and in the morning the carcass was completely hollowed out by these voracious feeders. After we had remained four days at this camp, we prepared to leave it. We had for our own part about five hundred pounds of dried meat, and the California men had prepared some three hundred more. This consisted of the fattest and choicest parts of eight or nine cows, a very small quantity only being taken from each, and the rest abandoned to the wolves. The pack animals were laden, the horses were saddled, and the mules harnessed to the cart. Even Tete Rouge was ready at last, and slowly moving from the ground, we resumed our journey eastward. When we had advanced about a mile, Shaw missed a valuable hunting knife and turned back in search of it, thinking that he had left it at the camp. He approached the place cautiously, fearful that Indians might be lurking about, for a deserted camp is dangerous to return to. He saw no enemy, but the scene was a wild and dreary one. 
The prairie was overshadowed by dull leaden clouds, for the day was dark and gloomy. The ashes of the fires were still smoking by the riverside. The grass around them was trampled down by men and horses, and strewn with all the litter of a camp. Our departure had been a gathering signal to the birds and beasts of prey. Shaw assured me that literally dozens of wolves were prowling about the smoldering fires, while multitudes were roaming over the prairie around. They all fled as he approached, some running over the sand beds and some over the grassy plains. The vultures in great clouds were soaring overhead, and the dead bull near the camp was completely blackened by the flock that had alighted upon it. They flapped their broad wings and stretched upward their crested heads and long skinny necks, fearing to remain, yet reluctant to leave their disgusting feast. As he searched about the fires, he saw the wolves seated on the distant hills, waiting for his departure. Having looked in vain for his knife, he mounted again, and left the wolves and the vultures to banquet freely upon the carrion of the camp. End of chapter 25Chapter Twenty Six of the Oregon Trail. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Oregon Trail by Francis Parkman, Jr. Chapter Twenty Six Down the Arkansas. In the summer of eighteen forty six, the wild and lonely banks of the upper Arkansas beheld for the first time the passage of an army. General Kearney, on his march to Santa Fe, adopted this route in preference to the old trail of the Cimarron. When we came down, the main body of the troops had already passed on. Price's Missouri Regiment, however, was still on the way, having left the frontier much later than the rest, and about this time we began to meet them moving along the trail, one or two companies at a time. No men ever embarked upon a military expedition with a greater love for the work before them than the Missourians, but if discipline and subordination be the criterion of merit, these soldiers were worthless indeed. Yet, when their exploits have rung through all America, it would be absurd to deny that they were excellent irregular troops. Their victories were gained in the teeth of every established precedent of warfare. They were owing to a singular combination of military qualities in the men themselves. Without discipline or a spirit of subordination, they knew how to keep their ranks and act as one man. Donovan's regiment marched through New Mexico more like a band of free companions than like the paid soldiers of a modern government. When General Taylor complimented Donovan on his success at Sacramento and elsewhere, the colonel's reply very well illustrates the relations which subsisted between the officers and men of his command. I don't know anything of the maneuvers. The boys kept coming to me to let them charge, and when I saw a good opportunity I told them they might go. They were off like a shot, and that's all I know about it. The backwoods lawyer was better fitted to conciliate the good will than to command the obedience of his men. There were many serving under him who both from character and education could better have held command than he. At the Battle of Sacramento his frontiersmen fought under every possible disadvantage. The Mexicans had chosen their own position. They were drawn up across the valley that led to their native city of Chihuahua. Their whole front was covered by entrenchments and defended by batteries of heavy cannon. They outnumbered the invaders five to one. An eagle flew over the Americans, and a deep murmur rose along their lines. The enemy's batteries opened, long they remained under fire, but when at length the word was given, they shouted and ran forward. In one of the divisions, when midway to the enemy, a drunken officer ordered a halt. The exasperated men hesitated to obey. "'Forward, boys!' cried a private from the ranks, and the Americans, rushing like tigers upon the enemy, bounded over the breastwork. Four hundred Mexicans were slain upon the spot, and the rest fled, scattering over the plain like sheep. The standards, cannon, and baggage were taken, and among the rest a wagon laden with cords, with which the Mexicans, in the fullness of their confidence, had made ready for tying the American prisoners. Donovan's volunteers, who gained this victory, passed up with the main army, 
but Price's soldiers, whom we now met, were men from the same neighborhood, precisely similar in character, manner, and appearance. One forenoon, as we were descending upon a very wide meadow, where we meant to rest for an hour or two, we saw a dark body of horsemen approaching at a distance. In order to find water, we were obliged to turn aside to the river bank, a full half mile from the trail. Here we put up a kind of awning, and spreading buffalo robes on the ground, Shaw and I sat down to smoke beneath it. "'We're going to catch it now,' said Shaw. "'Look at those fellows. There'll be no peace for us here.' and in good truth about half the volunteers had straggled away from the line of march and were riding over the meadow toward us. "'How are you?' said the first man who came up, alighting from his horse and throwing himself upon the ground. The rest followed close, and a score of them soon gathered about us, some lying at full length and some sitting on horseback. They all belonged to a company raised in St. Louis." There were some ruffian faces among them, and some haggard with debauchery, but on the whole they were extremely good-looking men, superior beyond measure to the ordinary rank and file of an army, except that they were booted to the knees, they wore their belts and military trappings over the ordinary dress of citizens. Besides their swords and holster pistols, they carried slung from their saddles the excellent Springfield carbines, loaded at the breech. They inquired the character of our party, and were anxious to know the prospect of killing buffalo, and the chance that their horses would stand the journey to Santa Fe. All this was well enough, but a moment after a worse visitation came upon us. "'How are you, strangers? Where are you going, and where are you from?' said a fellow, who came trotting up with an old straw hat on his head. He was dressed in the coarsest brown homespun cloth. His face was rather sallow from fever and ague, and his tall figure, though strong and sinewy, was quite thin, and had besides an angular look, which, together with his boorish seat on horseback, gave him an appearance anything but graceful. Plenty more of the same stamp were close behind him. Their company was raised in one of the frontier counties, and we soon had abundant evidence of their rustic breeding. Dozens of them came crowding round, pushing between our first visitors and staring at us with unabashed faces. "'Are you the captain?' asked one fellow. "'What's your business out here?' asked another. "'Where do you live when you're at home?' said a third. "'I reckon you're traitors,' surmised a fourth, and to crown the whole, one of them came confidentially to my side and inquired in a low voice, "'What's your partner's name?' As each newcomer repeated the same questions, the nuisance became intolerable. Our military visitors were soon disgusted at the concise nature of our replies, and we could overhear them muttering curses against us. While we sat smoking, not in the best imaginable humor, Tete Rouge's tongue was never idle. He never forgot his military character, and during the whole interview he was incessantly busy among his fellow soldiers. At length we placed him on the ground before us, and told him that he might play the part of spokesman for the whole. Tete Rouge was delighted, and we soon had the satisfaction of seeing him talk and gabble at such a rate that the torrent of questions was in a great measure diverted from us. A little while after, to our amazement, we saw a large cannon with four horses come lumbering up behind the crowd, and the driver, who was perched on one of the animals, stretching his neck so as to look over the rest of the men, called out, "'Where are you from, and what's your business?' The captain of one of the companies was among our visitors, drawn by the same curiosity that had attracted his men. Unless their faces belied them, not a few in the crowd might with great advantage have changed places with their commander. "'Well, men,' said he, lazily rising from the ground where he had been lounging, "'it's getting late. I reckon we had better be moving.' "'I shan't start yet anyhow,' said one fellow, who was lying half asleep with his head resting on his arm. "'Don't be in a hurry, Captain,' added the lieutenant. "'Well, have it your own way. We'll wait a while longer.' replied the obsequious commander. At length, however, our visitors went straggling away as they had come, and we, to our great relief, were left alone again. No one can deny the intrepid bravery of these men, their intelligence, and the bold frankness of their character, free from all that is mean and sordid. 
yet for the moment the extreme roughness of their manners half inclines one to forget their heroic qualities. Most of them seem without the least perception of delicacy or propriety, though among them individuals may be found, in whose manners there is a plain courtesy, while their features bespeak a gallant spirit equal to any enterprise. No one was more relieved than Delorier by the departure of the volunteers, for dinner was getting colder every moment. He spread a well-whitened buffalo hide upon the grass, placed in the middle the juicy hump of a fat cow, ranged around it the tin plates and cups, and then acquainted us that all was ready. Tete Rouge, with his usual alacrity on such occasions, was the first to take his seat. In his former capacity of steamboat clerk, he had learned to prefix the honorary Mr. to everybody's name, whether of high or low degree. So Jim Gurney was Mr. Gurney, Henry was Mr. Henry, and even Delorier, for the first time in his life, heard himself addressed as Mr. Delorier. This did not prevent him conceiving a violent enmity against Tete Rouge, who, in his futile though praiseworthy attempts to make himself useful, used always to intermeddle with cooking the dinners. Delorier's disposition knew no medium between smiles and sunshine and a downright tornado of wrath. He said nothing to Tete Rouge, but his wrongs rankled in his breast. Tete Rouge had taken his place at dinner. It was his happiest moment. He sat enveloped in the old buffalo coat, sleeves turned up in preparation for the work, and his short legs crossed on the grass before him. He had a cup of coffee by his side and his knife ready in his hand, and while he looked upon the fat hump ribs, his eyes dilated with anticipation. Deloria sat just opposite to him, and the rest of us by this time had taken our seats. "'How is this, Delorier? You haven't given us bread enough!' At this, Delorier's placid face flew instantly into a paroxysm of contortions. He grinned with wrath, chattered, gesticulated, and hurled forth a volley of incoherent words in broken English at the astonished Tete Rouge. It was just possible to make out that he was accusing him of having stolen and eaten four large cakes which had been laid by for dinner. Tete Rouge, utterly confounded at this sudden attack, stared at Delorier for a moment in dumb amazement, with mouth and eyes wide open. At last he found speech, and protested that the accusation was false, and that he could not conceive how he had offended Mr. Delorier, or provoked him to use such ungentlemanly expressions. The tempest of words raged with such fury that nothing else could be heard. But Tete Rouge, from his greater command of English, had a manifest advantage over Delorier, who, after sputtering and grimacing for a while, found his words quite inadequate to the expression of his wrath. He jumped up and vanished, jerking out between his teeth one furious sac enfant de grâce, a Canadian title of honor, made doubly emphatic by being usually applied together with a cut of the whip to refractory mules and horses. The next morning we saw an old buffalo escorting his cow with two small calves over the prairie. Close behind came four or five large white wolves, sneaking stealthily through the long meadow grass and watching for the moment when one of the children should chance to lag behind his parents. The old bull kept well on his guard and faced about now and then to keep the prowling ruffians at a distance. As we approached our nooning place, we saw five or six buffalo standing at the very summit of a tall bluff. Trotting forward to the spot where we meant to stop, I flung off my saddle and turned my horse loose. By making a circuit under cover of some rising ground, I reached the foot of the bluff unnoticed and climbed up its steep side. Lying under the brow of the declivity, I prepared to fire at the buffalo, who stood on the flat surface not five yards distant. Perhaps I was too hasty, for the gleaming rifle barrel leveled over the edge caught their notice. They turned and ran. Close as they were, it was impossible to kill them when in that position, and stepping upon the summit, I pursued them over the high arid tableland. It was extremely rugged and broken. A great sandy ravine was channeled through it with smaller ravines entering on each side like tributary streams. The buffalo scattered and I soon lost sight of most of them as they scuttled away through the sandy chasms. A bull and a cow alone kept in view, 
For a while they ran along the edge of the great ravine, appearing and disappearing as they dived into some chasm and again emerged from it. At last they stretched out upon the broad prairie, a plain nearly flat and almost devoid of verdure, for every short grass blade was dried and shriveled by the glaring sun. Now and then the old bull would face toward me. Whenever he did so, I fell to the ground and lay motionless. In this manner I chased them for about two miles, until at length I heard in front a deep, hoarse bellowing. A moment after, a band of about a hundred bulls, before hidden by a slight swell of the plain, came at once into view. The fugitives ran toward them. Instead of mingling with the band as I expected, they passed directly through and continued their flight. At this I gave up the chase, and kneeling down crawled to within gunshot of the bulls, and with panting breath and trickling brow sat down on the ground to watch them. My presence did not disturb them in the least. They were not feeding, for indeed there was nothing to eat, but they seemed to have chosen the parched and scorching desert as the scene of their amusements. Some were rolling on the ground amid a cloud of dust. Others, with a hoarse rumbling bellow, were butting their large heads together, while many stood motionless as if quite inanimate. Except their monstrous growth of tangled grisly mane, they had no hair, for their old coat had fallen off in the spring, and their new one had not as yet appeared. Sometimes an old bull would step forward and gaze at me with a grim and stupid countenance. Then he would turn and butt his next neighbor, then he would lie down and roll over in the dirt, kicking his hoofs in the air. When satisfied with this amusement, he would jerk his head and shoulders upward, and, resting on his forelegs to stare at me in this position, half blinded by his mane and his face covered with dirt, then up he would spring upon all fours and shake his dusty sides, turning half round, he would stand with his beard touching the ground in an attitude of profound abstraction, as if reflecting on his puerile conduct. "'You are too ugly to live,' thought I, and aiming at the ugliest, I shot three of them in succession. The rest were not at all discomposed at this. They kept on bellowing and butting and rolling on the ground as before. Henry Chatillon always cautioned us to keep perfectly quiet in the presence of a wounded buffalo, for any movement is apt to excite him to make an attack. So I sat still upon the ground, loading and firing with as little motion as possible. While I was thus employed, a spectator made his appearance. A little antelope came running up with remarkable gentleness to within fifty yards, and there it stood, its slender neck arched, its small horns thrown back, and its large dark eyes gazing on me with a look of eager curiosity. By the side of the shaggy and brutish monsters before me, it seemed like some lovely young girl wandering near a den of robbers or a nest of bearded pirates. The buffalo looked uglier than ever. "'Here goes for another of you,' thought I, feeling in my pouch for a percussion cap. Not a percussion cap was there. My good rifle was useless as an old iron bar. One of the wounded bulls had not yet fallen, and I waited for some time, hoping every moment that his strength would fail him. He still stood firm, looking grimly at me, and disregarding Henry's advice, I rose and walked away. Many of the bulls turned and looked at me, but the wounded brute made no attack. I soon came upon a deep ravine which would give me shelter in case of emergency, so I turned round and threw a stone at the bulls. They received it with the utmost indifference. Feeling myself insulted at their refusal to be frightened, I swung my hat, shouted, and made a show of running toward them. At this they crowded together and galloped off, leaving their dead and wounded upon the field. As I moved toward the camp, I saw the last survivor totter and fall dead. My speed in returning was wonderfully quickened by the reflection that the Pawnees were abroad and that I was defenseless in case of meeting with an enemy. I saw no living thing, however, except two or three squalid old bulls scrambling among the sand hills that flanked the great ravine. When I reached camp, the party was nearly ready for the afternoon move. We encamped that evening at a short distance from the river bank. 
About midnight, as we all lay asleep on the ground, the man nearest to me, gently reaching out his hand, touched my shoulder, and cautioned me at the same time not to move. It was bright starlight. Opening my eyes and slightly turning, I saw a large white wolf moving stealthily around the embers of our fire, with his nose close to the ground. Disengaging my hand from the blanket, I drew the cover from my rifle, which lay close at my side. The motion alarmed the wolf, and with long leaps he bounded out of the camp. Jumping up, I fired after him when he was about thirty yards distant. The melancholy hum of the bullet sounded far away through the night. At the sharp report, so suddenly breaking upon the stillness, all the men sprang up. "'You've killed him,' said one of them. "'No, I haven't,' said I. "'There he goes, running along the river.' Then there's two of them. Don't you see that one lying out yonder? We went to it, and instead of a dead white wolf, found the bleached skull of a buffalo. I had missed my mark, and what was worse, had grossly violated a standing law of the prairie. When in a dangerous part of the country, it is considered highly imprudent to fire a gun after encamping, lest the report should reach the ears of the Indians. The horses were saddled in the morning, and the last man had lighted his pipe at the dying ashes of the fire. The beauty of the day enlivened us all. Even Ellis felt its influence, and occasionally made a remark as we rode along, and Jim Gurney told endless stories of his cruisings in the United States service. The buffalo were abundant, and at length a large band of them went running up the hills on the left. "'Do you see them buffalo?' said Ellis. Now I'll bet any man I'll go and kill one with my Jaeger. And leaving his horse to follow on with the party, he strode up the hill after them. Henry looked at us with his peculiar humorous expression, and proposed that we should follow Ellis to see how he would kill a fat cow. As soon as he was out of sight, we rode up the hill after him, and waited behind a little ridge till we heard the report of the unfailing Jaeger. Mounting to the top, we saw Ellis clutching his favorite weapon with both hands and staring after the buffalo, who, one and all, were galloping off at full speed. As we descended the hill, we saw the party straggling along the trail below. When we joined them, another scene of amateur hunting awaited us. I forgot to say that when we met the volunteers, Tete Rouge had obtained a horse from one of them in exchange for his mule, whom he feared and detested. The horse he christened James. James, though not worth so much as the mule, was a large and strong animal. Tete Rouge was very proud of his new acquisition, and suddenly became ambitious to run a buffalo with him. At his request I lent him my pistols, though not without great misgivings, since when Tete Rouge hunted buffalo the pursuer was in more danger than the pursued. He hung the holsters at his saddle-bow, and now, as we passed along, a band of bulls left their grazing in the meadow and galloped in a long file across the trail in front. "'Now's your chance, Tet. Come, let's see you kill a bull.' Thus urged, the hunter cried, "'Get up!' And James, obedient to the signal, cantered deliberately forward at an abominably uneasy gait. Tete Rouge, as we contemplated him from behind, made a most remarkable figure. He still wore the old buffalo coat. His blanket, which was tied in a loose bundle behind his saddle, went jolting from one side to the other, and a large tin canteen half full of water which hung from his pommel was jerked about his leg in a manner which greatly embarrassed him. "'Let out your horse, man! Lay on your whip!' we called out to him. The buffalo were getting farther off at every instant. James, being ambitious to mend his pace, tugged hard at the rein, and one of his rider's boots escaped from the stirrup. "'Whoa! I say, whoa!' cried Tete Rouge, in great perturbation, and after much effort James's progress was arrested. The hunter came trotting back to the party, disgusted with buffalo running, and he was received with overwhelming congratulations. "'Too good a chance to lose,' said Shaw, pointing to another band of bulls on the left. We lashed our horses and galloped upon them. Shaw killed one with each barrel of his gun. I separated another from the herd and shot him. The small bullet of the rifled pistol, striking too far back, did not immediately take effect, and the bull ran on with unabated speed. Again and again I snapped the remaining pistol at him, 
I primed it afresh three or four times, and each time it missed fire, for the touch-hole was clogged up. Returning it to the holster, I began to load the empty pistol, still galloping by the side of the bull. By this time he was grown desperate. The foam flew from his jaws, and his tongue lolled out. Before the pistol was loaded, he sprang upon me, and followed up his attack with a furious rush. The only alternative was to run away or be killed. I took to flight, and the bull, bristling with fury, pursued me closely. The pistol was soon ready, and then looking back I saw his head five or six yards behind my horse's tail. To fire at it would be useless, for a bullet flattens against the adamantine skull of a buffalo bull. Inclining my body to the left, I turned my horse in that direction as sharply as his speed would permit. The bull, rushing blindly on with great force and weight, did not turn so quickly. As I looked back, his neck and shoulders were exposed to view. Turning in the saddle, I shot a bullet through them obliquely into his vitals. He gave over the chase, and soon fell to the ground. An English tourist represents a situation like this as one of imminent danger. This is a great mistake. The bull never pursues long, and the horse must be wretched indeed that cannot keep out of his way for two or three minutes. We were now come to a part of the country where we were bound in common prudence to use every possible precaution. We mounted guard at night, each man standing in his turn, and no one ever slept without drawing his rifle close to his side or folding it with him in his blanket. One morning our vigilance was stimulated by our finding traces of a large Comanche encampment. Fortunately for us, however, it had been abandoned nearly a week. On the next evening we found the ashes of a recent fire, which gave us at the time some uneasiness. At length we reached the caches, a place of dangerous repute, and it had a most dangerous appearance, consisting of sand hills everywhere, broken by ravines and deep chasms. Here we found the grave of Swan, killed at this place, probably by the Pawnees, two or three weeks before. His remains, more than once violated by the Indians and the wolves, were suffered at length to remain undisturbed in their wild burial place. For several days we met detached companies of Price's regiment. Horses would often break loose at night from their camps. One afternoon we picked up three of these stragglers quietly grazing along the river. After we came to camp that evening, Jim Gurney brought news that more of them were in sight. It was nearly dark, and a cold, drizzling rain had set in. But we all turned out, and after an hour's chase, nine horses were caught and brought in. One of them was equipped with saddle and bridle. Pistols were hanging at the pommel of the saddle, a carbine was slung at its side, and a blanket rolled up behind it. In the morning, glorying in our valuable prize, we resumed our journey, and our cavalcade presented a much more imposing appearance than ever before. We kept on till the afternoon, when, far behind, three horsemen appeared on the horizon. Coming on at a hand gallop, they soon overtook us, and claimed all the horses as belonging to themselves and others of their company. They were, of course, given up, very much to the mortification of Ellis and Jim Gurney. Our own horses now showed signs of fatigue, and we resolved to give them half a day's rest. We stopped at noon at a grassy spot by the river. After dinner, Shaw and Henry went out to hunt and while the men lounged about the camp, I lay down to read in the shadow of the cart. Looking up, I saw a bull grazing alone on the prairie more than a mile distant. I was tired of reading, and taking my rifle, I walked toward him. As I came near, I crawled upon the ground until I approached to within a hundred yards. Here I sat down upon the grass and waited till he should turn himself into a proper position to receive his death wound. He was a grim old veteran. His loves and his battles were over for that season, and now, gaunt and war-worn, he had withdrawn from the herd to graze by himself and recruit his exhausted strength. He was miserably emaciated. His mane was all in tatters. His hide was bare and rough as an elephant's, and covered with dried patches of the mud in which he had been wallowing. He showed all his ribs whenever he moved. He looked like some grisly old ruffian grown gray in blood and violence, and scowling on all the world from his misanthropic seclusion. 
The old savage looked up when I first approached and gave me a fierce stare. Then he fell to grazing again with an air of contemptuous indifference. The moment after, as if suddenly recollecting himself, he threw up his head, faced quickly about, and to my amazement came at a rapid trot directly toward me. I was strongly impelled to get up and run, but this would have been very dangerous. Sitting quite still, I aimed, as he came on, at the thin part of the skull above the nose. After he had passed over about three-quarters of the distance between us, I was on the point of firing when, to my great satisfaction, he stopped short. I had full opportunity of studying his countenance. His whole front was covered with a huge mass of coarse, matted hair, which hung so low that nothing but his two forefeet were visible beneath it. His short, thick horns were blunted and split to the very roots in his various battles, and across his nose and forehead were two or three large white scars which gave him a grim and at the same time a whimsical appearance. It seemed to me that he stood there motionless for a full quarter of an hour, looking at me through the tangled locks of his mane. For my part, I remained as quiet as he and looked quite as hard. I felt greatly inclined to come to term with him. My friend, thought I, if you let me off, I'll let you off. At length he seemed to have abandoned any hostile design. Very slowly and deliberately he began to turn about. Little by little his side came into view, all be plastered with mud. It was a tempting sight. I forgot my prudent intentions and fired my rifle. A pistol would have served at that distance. Round spun old bull like a top, and away he galloped over the prairie. He ran some distance, and even ascended a considerable hill before he lay down and died. After shooting another bull among the hills, I went back to camp. At noon on the 14th of September, a very large Santa Fe caravan came up. The plain was covered with the long files of their white-topped wagons, the close black carriages in which the traders travel and sleep, large droves of animals and men on horseback and on foot. They all stopped on the meadow near us. Our diminutive cart and handful of men made but an insignificant figure by the side of their wide and bustling camp. Tete Rouge went over to visit them, and soon came back with half a dozen biscuits in one hand and a bottle of brandy in the other. I inquired where he got them. Oh, said Tete Rouge, I know some of the traders. Dr. Dobbs is there besides. I asked who Dr. Dobbs might be. One of our St. Louis doctors, replied Tete Rouge. For two days past I had been severely attacked by the same disorder which had so greatly reduced my strength when at the mountains. At this time I was suffering not a little from the sudden pain and weakness which it occasioned. Tete Rouge, in answer to my inquiries, declared that Dr. Dobbs was a physician of the first standing. Without at all believing him, I resolved to consult this eminent practitioner. Walking over to the camp, I found him lying sound asleep under one of the wagons. He offered in his own person but an indifferent specimen of his skill, for it was five months since I had seen so cadaverous a face. His hat had fallen off, and his yellow hair was all in disorder. One of his arms supplied the place of a pillow. His pantaloons were wrinkled halfway up to his knees, and he was covered with little bits of grass and straw upon which he had rolled in his uneasy slumber. A Mexican stood near, and I made him a sign that he should touch the doctor. Up sprang the learned Dobbs, and, sitting upright, rubbed his eyes and looked about him in great bewilderment. I regretted the necessity of disturbing him, and said I had come to ask professional advice. "'Your system, sir, is in a disordered state,' said he solemnly, after a short examination. I inquired what might be the particular species of disorder. "'Evidently a morbid action of the liver,' replied the medical man. "'I will give you a prescription.' Repairing to the back of one of the covered wagons, he scrambled in. For a moment I could see nothing of him but his boots. At length he produced a box which he had extracted from some dark recess within, and opening it he presented me with a folded paper of some size. "'What is it?' said I. "'Calomel,' said the doctor. Under the circumstances I would have taken almost anything. There was not enough to do me much harm, and it might possibly do good.' 
so at camp that night I took the poison instead of supper. That camp is worthy of notice. The traders warned us not to follow the main trail along the river, unless, as one of them observed, you want to have your throats cut. The river at this place makes a bend, and a smaller trail, known as the ridge path, leads directly across the prairie from point to point, a distance of sixty or seventy miles. We followed this trail, and after traveling seven or eight miles we came to a small stream where we encamped. Our position was not chosen with much forethought or military skill. The water was in a deep hollow with steep high banks. On the grassy bottom of this hollow we picketed our horses, while we ourselves encamped upon the barren prairie just above. The opportunity was admirable either for driving off our horses or attacking us. After dark, as Tete Rouge was sitting at supper, we observed him pointing with a face of speechless horror over the shoulder of Henry, who was opposite to him. Aloof amid the darkness appeared a gigantic black apparition, solemnly swaying to and fro. It advanced steadily upon us. Henry, half vexed and half amused, jumped up, spread out his arms, and shouted. The invader was an old buffalo bull who, with characteristic stupidity, was walking directly into camp. It cost some shouting and swinging of hats before we could bring him first to a halt and then to a rapid retreat. That night the moon was full and bright, but as the black clouds chased rapidly over it, we were at one moment in light and the next in darkness. As the evening advanced, a thunderstorm came up. It struck us with such violence that the tent would have been blown over if we had not interposed the cart to break the force of the wind. At length it subsided to a steady rain. I lay awake through nearly the whole night, listening to its dull patter upon the canvas above. The moisture which filled the tent and trickled from everything in it did not add to the comfort of the situation. About twelve o'clock Shaw went out to stand guard amid the rain and pitch darkness. Monroe, the most vigilant as well as one of the bravest among us, was also on the alert. When about two hours had passed, Shaw came silently in, and touching Henry, called him in a low, quick voice to come out. "'What is it?' I asked. "'Indians, I believe,' whispered Shaw. "'But lie still. I'll call you if there's a fight.' He and Henry went out together. I took the cover from my rifle, put a fresh percussion cap upon it, and then, being in much pain, lay down again. In about five minutes Shaw came in again. All right, he said, as he lay down to sleep. Henry was now standing guard in his place. He told me in the morning the particulars of the alarm. Monroe's watchful eye discovered some dark objects down in the hollow among the horses, like men creeping on all fours. Lying flat on their faces, he and Shaw crawled to the edge of the bank, and were soon convinced that what they saw were Indians. Shaw silently withdrew to call Henry, and they all lay watching in the same position. Henry's eye is of the best on the prairie. He detected after a while the true nature of the moving objects. They were nothing but wolves creeping among the horses. It is very singular that when picketed near a camp, horses seldom show any fear of such an intrusion. The wolves appear to have no other object than that of gnawing the trail ropes of rawhide by which the animals are secured. Several times in the course of the journey, my horse's trail rope was bitten in two by these nocturnal visitors. End of chapter 26《But as sunset approached, they pricked up their ears and mended their pace. Water was not far off. When we came to the descent of the broad shadowy valley where it lay, an unlooked-for sight awaited us. 
the stream glistened at the bottom, and along its banks were pitched a multitude of tents, while hundreds of cattle were feeding over the meadows. Bodies of troops, both horse and foot, and long trains of wagons with men, women, and children were moving over the opposite ridge and descending the broad declivity in front. These were the Mormon battalion, in the service of government, together with a considerable number of Missouri volunteers. The Mormons were to be paid off in California, and they were allowed to bring with them their families and property. There was something very striking in the half-military, half-patriarchal appearance of these armed fanatics, thus on their way with their wives and children, to found, if might be, a Mormon empire in California. We were much more astonished than pleased at the sight before us. In order to find an unoccupied camping ground, we were obliged to pass a quarter of a mile up the stream, and here we were soon beset by a swarm of Mormons and Missourians. The United States officer in command of the whole came also to visit us and remained some time at our camp. In the morning the country was covered with mist. We were always early risers, but before we were ready the voices of men driving in the cattle sounded all around us. As we passed above their camp we saw through the obscurity that the tents were falling and the ranks rapidly forming and mingled with the cries of women and children, the rolling of the Mormon drums and the clear blast of their trumpets sounded through the mist. From that time to the journey's end, we met almost every day long trains of government wagons laden with stores for the troops and crawling at a snail's pace toward Santa Fe. Tete Rouge had a mortal antipathy to danger, but on a foraging expedition one evening he achieved an adventure more perilous than had yet befallen any man in the party. The night after we left the ridge path we encamped close to the river. At sunset we saw a train of wagons encamping on the trail about three miles off, and though we saw them distinctly, our little cart, as it afterward proved, entirely escaped their view. For some days Tete Rouge had been longing eagerly after a dram of whiskey. So, resolving to improve the present opportunity, he mounted his horse James, slung his canteen over his shoulder, and set forth in search of his favorite liquor. Some hours passed without his returning. We thought that he was lost, or perhaps that some stray Indian had snapped him up. While the rest fell asleep, I remained on guard. Late at night a tremulous voice saluted me from the darkness, and Tete Rouge and James soon became visible advancing toward the camp. Tete Rouge was in much agitation and big with some important tidings. Sitting down on the shaft of the cart, he told the following story. When he left the camp he had no idea, he said, how late it was. By the time he approached the wagoners it was perfectly dark and as he saw them all sitting around their fires within the circle of wagons, their guns laid by their sides, he thought he might as well give warning of his approach, in order to prevent a disagreeable mistake. Raising his voice to the highest pitch, he screamed out in prolonged accents, Camp! Ahoy! This eccentric salutation produced anything but the desired result. Hearing such hideous sounds proceeding from the outer darkness, the wagoners thought that the whole Pawnee nation were about to break in and take their scalps. Up they sprang, staring with terror. Each man snatched his gun. Some stood behind the wagon, some threw themselves flat on the ground, and in an instant twenty cocked muskets were leveled full at the horrified Tete Rouge, who just then began to be visible through the darkness. "'There they come!' cried the master wagoner. "'Fire! Fire! Shoot that feller!' "'No, no!' screamed Tete Rouge, in an ecstasy of fright. "'Don't fire! Don't! I'm a friend! I'm an American citizen!' "'You're a friend, be you?' cried a gruff voice from the wagons. "'Then what are you yelling out thar for, like a wild engine? "'Come along up here, if you're a man!' "'Keep your guns pinted at him,' added the master wagoner. "'Maybe he's a decoy-like.' Tete Rouge, in utter bewilderment, made his approach, with the gaping muzzles of the musket still before his eyes. He succeeded at last in explaining his character and situation, and the Missourians admitted him into camp. He got no whiskey, 
but as he represented himself as a great invalid and suffering much from coarse fare, they made up a contribution for him of rice, biscuit, and sugar from their own rations. In the morning at breakfast, Tete Rouge once more related this story. We hardly knew how much of it to believe, though after some cross-questioning we failed to discover any flaw in the narrative. Passing by the wagoner's camp, they confirmed Tete Rouge's account in every particular. I wouldn't have been in that feller's place, said one of them, for the biggest heap of money in Missouri. To Tete Rouge's great wrath, they expressed a firm conviction that he was crazy. We left them, after giving them the advice not to trouble themselves about war whoops in the future, since they would be apt to feel an Indian's arrow before they heard his voice. A day or two after, we had an adventure of another sort with a party of wagoners. Henry and I rode forward to hunt. After that day there was no probability that we should meet with buffalo, and we were anxious to kill one for the sake of fresh meat. They were so wild that we hunted all the morning in vain, but at noon as we approached Cow Creek we saw a large band feeding near its margin. Cow Creek is densely lined with trees which intercept the view beyond, and it runs, as we afterward found, at the bottom of a deep trench. We approached by riding along the bottom of a ravine. When we were near enough, I held the horses while Henry crept toward the buffalo. I saw him take his seat within shooting distance, prepare his rifle, and look about to select his victim. The death of a fat cow was certain, when, suddenly, a great smoke arose from the bed of the creek with a rattling volley of musketry. A score of long-legged Missourians leaped out from among the trees and ran after the buffalo, who one and all took to their heels and vanished. These fellows had crawled up the bed of the creek to within a hundred yards of the buffalo. Never was there a fairer chance for a shot. They were good marksmen, all cracked away at once, and yet not a buffalo fell. In fact, the animal is so tenacious of life that it requires no little knowledge of anatomy to kill it, and it is very seldom that a novice succeeds in his first attempt at approaching. The balked Missourians were excessively mortified especially when Henry told them, if they had kept quiet, he would have killed meat enough in ten minutes to feed their whole party. Our friends, who were at no great distance, hearing such a formidable fusillade, thought the Indians had fired the volley for our benefit. Shaw came galloping on to reconnoiter and learn if we were yet in the land of the living. At Cow Creek we found the very welcome novelty of ripe grapes and plums, which grew there in abundance. At the little Arkansas, not much farther on, we saw the last buffalo, a miserable old bull, roaming over the prairie, alone and melancholy. From this time forward, the character of the country was changing every day. We had left behind us the great arid deserts, meagerly covered by the tufted buffalo grass, with its pale green hue and its short, shriveled blades. The plains before us were carpeted with rich and verdant herbage sprinkled with flowers. In place of buffalo we found plenty of prairie hens, and we bagged them by dozens without leaving the trail. In three or four days we saw before us the broad woods and the emerald meadows of Council Grove, a scene of striking luxuriance and beauty. It seemed like a new sensation as we rode beneath the resounding arches of these noble woods. The trees were ash, oak, elm, maple, and hickory, their mighty limbs deeply overshadowing the path, while enormous grapevines were entwined among them, purple with fruit. The shouts of our scattered party, and now and then a report of a rifle, rang amid the breathing stillness of the forest. We rode forth again with regret into the broad light of the open prairie, Little more than a hundred miles now separated us from the frontier settlements. The whole intervening country was a succession of verdant prairies, rising in broad swells and relieved by trees clustering like an oasis around some spring or following the course of a stream along some fertile hollow. These are the prairies of the poet and the novelist. We had left danger behind us. Nothing was to be feared from the Indians of this region, the Sacs and Foxes, the Kansas and the Osages. We had met with signal good fortune, 
although for five months we had been traveling with an insufficient force through a country where we were at any moment liable to depredation not a single animal had been stolen from us and our only loss had been one old mule bitten to death by a rattlesnake three weeks after we reached the frontier the pawnees and the comanches began a regular series of hostilities on the arkansas trail killing men and driving off horses they attacked without exception every party large or small that passed during the next six months diamond spring rock creek elder grove and other camping places besides were passed all in quick succession at rock creek we found a train of government provision wagons under the charge of an emaciated old man in his seventy-first year some restless american devil had driven him into the wilderness at a time when he should have been seated at his fireside with his grandchildren on his knees. I am convinced that he never returned. He was complaining that night of a disease, the wasting effects of which upon a younger and stronger man I myself had proved from severe experience. Long ere this, no doubt, the wolves have howled their moonlight carnival over the old man's attenuated remains. Not long after, we came to a small trail leading to Fort Leavenworth, distant but one day's journey. Tete Rouge here took leave of us. He was anxious to go to the fort in order to receive payment for his valuable military services. So he and his horse James, after bidding an affectionate farewell, set out together, taking with them as much provision as they could conveniently carry, including a large quantity of brown sugar. On a cheerless rainy evening we came to our last encamping ground some pigs belonging to a shawnee farmer were grunting and rooting at the edge of the grove i wonder how fresh pork tastes murmured one of the party and more than one voice murmured in response the fiat went forth that pig must die and a rifle was leveled forthwith at the countenance of the plumpest porker just then a wagon train with some twenty missourians came out from among the trees the marksman suspended his aim deeming it inexpedient under the circumstances to consummate the deed of blood. In the morning we made our toilet as well as circumstances would permit, and that is saying but very little. In spite of the dreary rain of yesterday, there never was a brighter and gayer autumnal morning than that on which we returned to the settlements. We were passing through the country of the half-civilized Shawanos, it was a beautiful alternation of fertile plains and groves, whose foliage was just tinged with the hues of autumn, while close beneath them rested the neat log-houses of the Indian farmers. Every field and meadow bespoke the exuberant fertility of the soil. The maize stood rustling in the wind, matured and dry, its shining yellow ears thrust out between the gaping husks. Squashes and enormous yellow pumpkins lay basking in the sun in the midst of their brown and shriveled leaves. Robins and blackbirds flew about the fences, and everything in short betokened our near approach to home and civilization. The forests that border on the Missouri soon rose before us, and we entered the wide tract of shrubbery which forms their outskirts. We had passed the same road on our outward journey in the spring, but its aspect was totally changed. The young wild apple trees, then flushed with their fragrant blossoms, were now hung thickly with ruddy fruit. Tall grass flourished by the roadside in place of the tender shoots just peeping from the warm and oozy soil. The vines were laden with dark purple grapes, and the slender twigs of the maple, then tasseled with their clusters of small red flowers, now hung out a gorgeous display of leaves stained by the frost with burning crimson. On every side we saw the tokens of maturity and decay, where all had before been fresh and beautiful. We entered the forest, and ourselves and our horses were checkered as we passed along by the bright spots of sunlight that fell between the opening boughs. On either side the dark rich masses of foliage almost excluded the sun, though here and there its rays could find their way down, striking through the broad leaves and lighting them with a pure transparent green. Squirrels barked at us from the trees, coveys of young partridges ran rustling over the leaves below, and the golden oriole, the blue jay, and the flaming red bird darted among the shadowy branches. 
we hailed these sights and sounds of beauty by no means with an unmingled pleasure. Many and powerful as were the attractions which drew us toward the settlements, we looked back even at that moment with an eager longing toward the wilderness of prairies and mountains behind us. For myself, I had suffered more that summer from illness than ever before in my life, and yet to this hour I cannot recall those savage scenes and savage men without a strong desire again to visit them. At length, for the first time during about half a year, we saw the roof of a white man's dwelling between the opening trees. A few moments after, we were riding over the miserable log bridge that leads into the center of Westport. Westport had beheld strange scenes, but a rougher-looking troop than ours, with our worn equipments and broken-down horses, was never seen even there. We passed the well-remembered tavern, Boone's Grocery, and old Vogel's Dram Shop, and encamped on a meadow beyond. Here we were soon visited by a number of people who came to purchase our horses and equipage. This matter disposed of, we hired a wagon and drove on to Kansas Landing. Here we were again received under the hospital roof of our old friend Colonel Chick, and seated on his porch we looked down once more on the eddies of the Missouri. Delorier made his appearance in the morning, strangely transformed by the assistance of a hat, a coat, and a razor. His little log house was among the woods not far off. It seemed he had meditated giving a ball on the occasion of his return, and had consulted Henry Chatillon as to whether it would do to invite his bourgeois. Henry expressed his entire conviction that we would not take it amiss, and the invitation was now proffered accordingly, Delorier adding as a special inducement that Antoine Le Jeunesse was to play the fiddle. We told him we would certainly come, but before the evening arrived, a steamboat which came down from Fort Leavenworth prevented our being present at the expected festivities. Delorier was on the rock at the landing place, waiting to take leave of us. Adieu, mes bourgeois, adieu, adieu, he cried out as the bull pulled off. When you go another time to the Rocky Montagne, I will go with you. Yes, I will go. He accompanied this patronizing assurance by jumping about, swinging his hat, and grinning from ear to ear. As the boat rounded a distant point, the last object that met our eyes was Delorier still lifting his hat and skipping about the rock. We had taken leave of Monroe and Jim Gurney at Westport, and Henry Chatillon went down in the boat with us. The passage to St. Louis occupied eight days, during about a third of which we were fast aground on sandbars. We passed the steamer Amelia, crowded with a roaring crew of disbanded volunteers, swearing, drinking, gambling, and fighting. At length one evening we reached the crowded levee of St. Louis. Repairing to the planter's house, we caused diligent search to be made for our trunks, which after some time were discovered stowed away in the farthest corner of the storeroom. In the morning we hardly recognized each other. A frock of broadcloth had supplanted the frock of buckskin, well-fitted pantaloons took the place of the Indian leggings, and polished boots were substituted for the gaudy moccasins. After we had been several days at St. Louis, we heard news of Tete Rouge. He had contrived to reach Fort Leavenworth, where he had found the paymaster and received his money. As a boat was just ready to start for St. Louis, he went on board and engaged his passage. This done, he immediately got drunk on shore, and the boat went off without him. It was some days before another opportunity occurred, and meanwhile the sutler's stores furnished him with the abundant means of keeping up his spirits. Another steamboat came at last, the clerk of which happened to be a friend of his, and by the advice of some charitable person on shore he persuaded Tete Rouge to remain on board, intending to detain him there until the boat should leave the fort. At first Tete Rouge was well contented with this arrangement. But on applying for a dram, the barkeeper, at the clerk's instigation, refused to let him have it. Finding them both inflexible, in spite of his entreaties, he became desperate and made his escape from the boat. The clerk found him after a long search in one of the barracks. A circle of dragoons stood contemplating him as he lay on the floor, maudlin drunk and crying dismally. 
With the help of one of them, the clerk pushed him on board, and our informant, who came down in the same boat, declares that he remained in great despondency during the whole passage. As we left St. Louis soon after his arrival, we did not see the worthless, good-natured little vagabond again. On the evening before our departure, Henry Chatillon came to our rooms at the planter's house to take leave of us. No one who met him in the streets of St. Louis would have taken him for a hunter fresh from the Rocky Mountains. He was very neatly and simply dressed in a suit of dark cloth, for although since his sixteenth year he had scarcely been for a month together among the abodes of men, he had a native good taste and a sense of propriety which always led him to pay great attention to his personal appearance. His tall, athletic figure, with its easy, flexible motions, appeared to advantage in his present dress, and his fine face, though roughened by a thousand storms, was not at all out of keeping with it. We took leave of him with much regret, and unless his changing features as he shook us by the hand belied him, the feeling on his part was no less than on ours. Shaw had given him a horse at Westport. My rifle, which he had always been fond of using, as it was an excellent piece, much better than his own, is now in his hands, and perhaps at this moment its sharp voice is startling the echoes of the Rocky Mountains. On the next morning we left town, and after a fortnight of railroads and steamboat, we saw once more the familiar features of home. End of chapter 27 End of the Oregon Trail by Francis Parkman, Jr.